Right, we're going to get started if that's all right, everyone. Yeah. Uh, my name is Steve Roach. I'm from the Worcester Police Department Gang Unit. I'm a sergeant here in the um, police department. I came on the police department in 1987. I started at 23 years old. Um, so that means I've been on the police department 36 years or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't look that old, but I'm old. Uh, I'll tell you a little about myself. I grew up in uh, Worcester. I grew up in Belmont Street. I lived on Stanton Street uh, in a three-decker, as we all call them. And then I moved to Lincoln Village where I lived in an apartment. I was raised by a single parent mom. I never met my dad. My brother, my mother raised myself, my brother, my sister. My brother went on to become the deputy chief here. He recently retired and I'm still here. And I tell you that so you know my background. It's nice to know who's here, what's going on. You know, everyone says, why'd you want to become a police officer? You know, uh, to go out and help people, yes. But more importantly, I wanted to drive the car 100 miles an hour with the blue lights on. <laughs> and it really is cool. Um, and uh, but I'll get this on. The reason what what uh, helped me uh, become a police officer was I didn't like the fact living in Lincoln Village. Sometimes the police would come in. And I thought they treated us differently because we lived in the if you will call it a housing project. And one day I was at school and I was complaining, and one of the teachers said to me, "You know what? Instead of complaining, why don't you do something about it? Why don't you become a police officer?" I said, I'm not going to become a police officer. <laughs> And then my brother became a police officer. He said, hey, you should try this police officer thing. <laughs> so I was like, well, all right, maybe. So I took the test, and sure enough, I did really well, and here I am today. I, uh, when I came on this job, I had graduated from Burncourt High School. I was an average student at best. I had good days and bad days like everybody else. Uh, I came into this, this career, and then I learned that if you had a college degree, you, one, it helped you go forward, and secondly, you got more money. So uh, two years ago, I finally finished my master's degree in college. So I, I did that. I was the oldest kid in class. You know what I'm saying? I was that old guy in class. Mm -hmm. But I did it, and uh, this has been a great job for me. Um, I love the job. It's been good to me. I'll show you what, what we do in the gang unit. I'll answer all your questions. Any questions you have, I'll answer them. I still live in the city of Worcester today, um, so I should be able to answer your questions. Hopefully, if not, I'm just going to make something up. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, so having said that, we're going to go through some slides. Uh, most of the slides, if, if you see a slide, the, the faces are blocked out uh, on, I just double checked it to make sure, but if you saw a slide or something that you thought you knew somebody, and if you wanted to ask me about it, we can't. But anything you see today that I put out here is from open source social media or things like that, okay? So everyone kind of get that, because I don't want you to see all of a sudden your husband, your boyfriend, your wife, whatever. <laughs> oh my God. So hopefully that doesn't happen to anybody. I, I don't think there is, and we'll go forward. I'm going to talk about the gang unit first. Um, let me just see where this one is. So here it is right now. We have six police officers. One side, it would be me. We fall under the uh, investigative services. We're also part of the shooting response team. And there's the, the, the three biggest thing that we do in the gang unit is intelligence, intervention, and suppression. And they're pretty self-explanatory. Right? So intelligence, we are the intelligence source of the police department. Uh, if there's an ongoing problem with uh, gangs, such as a shooting, a homicide, whatever, uh, it is our job to have the information on that particular uh, shooting, if it is in fact gang involved. We work alongside the detectives, the homicide guys, if it's a murder, We'll, we'll come in with the uh, men and women of the Detective Bureau, and we'll work on that homicide, and we would provide any intelligence that needed on the gang angle, if in fact there was a gang angle. That would be our job or our role on that. We'd also be involved in the arrest of the person if it led to that. The intervention, uh, that's pretty much we want to meet with some of these kids, and we'll talk about our programs later on in the presentation today. But basically the intervention is we want to talk to some of these kids and get them to maybe not join the gang, all right, get them out of the gang. The hardest, thing, the easiest thing to do is to arrest uh, the gang kids, right? The hardest thing is to get these kids not to join a gang, right? To get them to want to come out of the gang. That's the, that's the hardest thing that for any community, not just Worcester. That's, that's national across the country, okay? Um, and then the suppression would be the enforcement, okay? That's where we would come in and make an arrest for someone with a firearm or something along those lines to, uh, you know, keep the street safe. So there has to be a suppression point when you're dealing with anything like this with violence involved individuals, gang members, however you want, whatever term you want to use, okay? So that would be the suppression and that's where we would go in and do the arrest. Is shooting response team different than SWAT? It is, that's a great question. I'm not a SWAT guy. Um, so the shooting response, we're gonna talk about right now. See, look at, see, ooh, <laughs> how, how was that for timing? That was really just luck. But here we go, right? So the shooting is formed in 2010. And it's responding to gun violence in the city of Worcester. 
The team consists of uh, four gang unit officers, two homicide detectives, and a vice squad officer. We've increased that now. There are two vice squad officers on that now. And each officer is hand selected based on the knowledge of the violent offenders, gun arrest, and gang activity. So what uh, the chief's done is um, put together this group, and it's made up of obviously people that bring something to the team, if you will. Uh, everyone in this building has their, their, their specialty. Uh, we looked at this group and we said, we're gonna work on some of the shootings and some of the murders, and we're gonna put that group together. Because if you look at, and once again, this is nationally anywhere across the country, and I, I, I do travel to Chicago. I travel around and do different things uh, on the gang subject. So if we look at this model, what we've done here is we said a lot of our shootings are going to be involved in something. It's going to be probably a gang angle, right? There could be a drug angle, a drug angle, right? And then maybe it was just something else. So if we look at that, that's why we form this team. So we have an expert in each area where we can come together and we'll say, hey, we had a homicide, we had a murder, Steve Roach is the victim. What do you think? We might say, oh, well, Steve Roach, he had a problem with, you know, you know, Mr. Smith over here and their rival gang members, and we know that. So we would look at that angle. Or maybe uh, one of the drug officers say, you know, that Steve Roach was a really, really big drug dealer, and he was known to carry around a lot of cash, and maybe it was a drug rip-off murder, you know? Or maybe the detective would say, you know, that Steve Roach, someone home invaded him two years ago, you know, um, and we think that could all be related. So you get what, that's kind of how we, we work that uh, on those specific cases, okay? I want to make some, that's not every case. All right, I want to make sure that's not every homicide, okay? But that's uh, how that shooting response is. It is different from SWAT. I don't know if some SWAT's going to come in here and talk to you folks. I don't yeah, know that. Yeah. So, they'll, uh, so I don't want to say anything about SWAT, you okay. know, anything bad about SWAT. They're good guys <laughs> and girls. Um, but I'm kidding, obviously. But uh, So there we go. That's how that came together, and that's what we're doing as we speak today. That is in place right now with the police. So we look at a lot of people say, why do the kids join the gangs? This shouldn't be a shock to anybody in the room here. It's low self-esteem, the peer pressure, protection, society, could hip-hop culture, and family, right? A lot of times, right, if your mother is a blood and your father's a blood, you're a blood drop, right? I'm sure you've heard that term, right? A blood drop is someone whose parents are both bloods. Uh, a lot of times you'll get the family, you may have a, a older brother or a father or a son, it just goes down to generation that they are, in fact, gang members, okay? It's just part of the family, it's who they are. And I want to make one thing clear right now. It's not against the law to be a gang member in Massachusetts. There is no law preventing that. So I was in court recently, and we have gang members that will be right in open court, and they'll just, you know, say something out to the people in the courthouse, whether, whatever it may be, you know, uh, threes up, I'm a soldier, whatever. Whatever they may use as a gang thing, and there's nothing illegal about being a gang member in the state of Massachusetts, okay? There are some federal enhancements. Uh, which we'll talk about in a particular case later on, but just so we all understand that there's no no law being uh, broken by someone being a gang member, okay? And if we look at the low self-esteem, I think that's pretty pretty much explained itself. Some of these uh, gang kids or these leaders or you know higher up in the gang, whatever term you're comfortable using, they may look for someone like that with low self-esteem. That may be a boy or a girl. They figure they can easily influence, bring them in, like bring them into the group and have them do, for lack of a better word, their dirty their dirty work for them. Okay. Peer pressure, hey, maybe you're hanging out and all these kids, come on, you're gonna hang out, you're gonna join, whatever, and maybe uh, the, the boy or the girl just gives in and says, you know what, I, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna hang out with these guys and, and, and uh, girls and do the thing. Protection, protection is one that a lot of these kids are sold that false pretense. We are going to protect you, right? Uh, we used to go to all the sixth grades in the city of Worcester. We used to speak to 2,500 sixth grade kids. And one of the biggest things we found was this protection, right? So uh, the easiest way to do it is, and you know, I don't, I don't know you, right? What is your name? Kathy. Kathy. So Kathy here, you know, maybe she goes to a public school. And every day, what's your name? Pam. Pam. Pam and her crew, every day they're picking on Kathy, right? They're giving her a hard time. They're, you know, whatever it may be. Just making her life miserable every day, every day, right? Then finally, Pam says to Kathy after about a week, you know, Kathy, we've been watching you. We've given you a hard time. We stole your money. We stole your shoes. You know, we made you like, you never, you, never, you, never, you never told on us. You're not a snitch. We want to bring you on board. We want to bring you in our group. And, and you know, and, and, she, and Kathy's like, oh, my God, oh, my God, here we go, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know what I'm saying? That's one little small play they would do. So now she thinks, I'm protected. I have now joined Pam's crew, right? But what we have to tell kids today in society is this, Pam's crew is maybe 30 people, right? And now 
the day that Kathy joins that 30 person gang, she's now really has, she now has probably over 100 enemies, yeah. rival mm -hmm. gangs. Yeah. I, and I was just trying to figure out the best way to explain this. Does that make sense to everyone? So now she joined yeah, this 30-person gang, but what she didn't realize the day she joined is all the rivals, yeah. right? And we're going to show some stuff on social media how these kids are right up there showing it, you know? I don't know, Kathy. Maybe Kathy's feeling good about being a gang member. <laughs> so she takes the social media, right? And now she's putting herself all over the place, right? Right? <laughs> oh my God, what happened to Kathy? Kathy's a gang member. So, but, but, so that's the protection thing, okay? And it's really, they're being played, a lot of young kids are being played into that. And they think, oh my God, if I join, I'm gonna be safe. And they're really not, all right? And that's the message we try to get out. We'll look at some national gangs, we'll go real quick. The Latin Kings have been around forever. This should be no secret to anybody. The yellow and the black, they're gonna use the five-pointed crown. There it is, right? The LK, right? They tag our builder gut work. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> yeah. And so you'll see, like I said, the yellow and black. Now I'm old, I'm 60 years old. Some of you, uh, you know, maybe remember the movie Colors, right? Mm -hmm. Years ago with the gangs. And so these kids aren't gonna show up looking like a bumblebee, right? They're not gonna be all yellow, oh my God, look at this, this person. That's not really the case. A lot of times what you'll see, and once again, this is national all over the country, you'll see some of these Latin Kings they may represent, and you're going to see this a lot of gang, the gang culture itself, they will use um, athletic apparel, okay? So you might see Latin Kings, they might uh, wear Boston Bruins, right? The yellow and the black, right? Mm -hmm. they, 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 especially when the Bruins won the Stanley Cup and they made that t-shirt with the bear, with the claws. Like, ah. So a lot of them might have been rocking that particular shirt. And they're wearing that for the yellow and the black for the Latin Kings, okay? Like you could see Pittsburgh Steelers. They may wear Pittsburgh Steelers uh, clothing, okay? But a lot of times they will represent uh, with a particular uh, item of clothing, and it will be that, okay? And just remember, it's the five points. And the five points, so I've been around a long time. So when I'm talking to somebody, a male or a female, if they're a Latin king and I have a discussion with them, at some point, that person is going to go like this. And as soon as they do that, they're taking their five points and putting over their heart. So in my particular case, if I show up at a shooting or something, and maybe I roll up and I don't know this young what's, Michelle. Michelle. I roll up on Michelle and there's a shooting and I say, Michelle, what's going on? She goes, I swear to God on everything I love, I don't know nothing. She doesn't even realize, she just really told me she's a Latin king, right? Latin yeah. queen, right? By going like this over, I swear to God on everything I love. So those are just some of the things we look for and that's what, what it's like in the end with these Latin kings, okay? All right. So now we'll look at the vice lords, right? 2212, anyone know what 2212 is? I'm not going to think you're a vice lord if you know the answer. You can tell me. Anybody know? Alphabetic. Yep. It's the V and the L, right? 22 is the V, 12 is the L, right? V and the L for the vice lords, right? And they could just do it like this, whatever. So the vice lords are they're a national gang once again. They're, um, they, they're, the presence has been really strong in the city for a long time since I've been in the gang unit. Um, they obviously originated, a lot of these kids orig originated in the city of Chicago. And I just want to make sure, so this is a case we did with the, with the, this is kind of shows you how it works. This was in 2019, we did a wiretap case. So what happens a lot of times, when we do a gang case, something like that, we may have to go to a wiretap, we would use our federal partners, and we were able to do this case, and this is kind of what you see on TV, right? We map it out, we put the targets, the houses, little pictures, little badges, and then we go from there and we listen to the phones. So, when we... In this day and age, right, with technology, right, telephones, right, and computers and whatnot, when we do a wiretap today, we can also read the text messages, right? But we, everything is with a warrant. I want to make that clear. I don't even think that we are doing that without, we get a search warrant, whether it be state or federal, and we can, that's how we do that, okay? Uh, we monitor that particular case, we build that case, and then like I said, in this particular case, that was a federal case, and then we, once we have um, enough evidence or the case comes to an end, we make the arrest and, and they all go to federal court. And a lot of times they go to prison. Um, and, and the thing with these young kids, these gang kids, and the law don't realize is, a couple of things they don't realize, is in the federal system, they hand out the sentences in months. So you could go to court and they could say, I sentence you to 60 months. 
And I was at a particular case where a young man got 60 months. He goes, that's nothing. I said, that's five years. And he went. <laughs> it is five years. I said, it is. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is a lot of these kids don't realize when they go come in contact with the federal government is they go to court. It's the United States versus Steve Rhodes. So you may end up in court. You could end up in court in like Texas or who knows where. Florida, you're not going to necessarily be in I'm jail, I'm sorry, in jail around here. You could be in jail in a, in a whole other state, okay? And a lot of these kids don't realize that. The Crips are here, um, same thing, they're a national gang, right? They didn't really use the color blue. Uh, they might use a light blue, like a Toronto Blue Jay, things like that. All right, they're sworn enemies of the Bloods. You'll see the B is crossed out, right? Blood killers, all right? You'll see all that. You'll see the, uh, the uh, upside down B. That's just the disrespect, all right? So if you, if you saw that or, you know, in your neighborhood or whatever, or God forbid, your, your kid's books or something, you'd be on, you'd be on point to that. Anytime you see a cross out, it's normally a gang thing, okay? It's in the gang world, okay? That's what, that's what they would use, all right? And they're just going to use the C like that. What's the 187? That's the murder code for California. Go. So the bloods, you come over to the bloods, right? Same thing, right? Crip killer, CK, right? They're going to do the three dots. I don't know if you ever saw that. They'll burn a dot in their arm. They'll use a red, uh, something obviously hot, like a cigarette or whatever, and they'll burn it in their arm. They'll make a raised, uh, the three spots. They can call it a paw. It's right here on the bottom right. They, if they use the word crab, that's an insult to the Crips. They call them crabs. And they're going to use the little B or the big B, right? So they can throw the, they can throw, that's the big B right there, or the little B. They'll throw it right up there. They're going to always wear red, okay? And we talk about, maybe they're going to wear a Boston Red Sox hat, right? Because they like that red B. So a lot of times you may see, you may be watching a, a video in, in California or something like that, and you can see some kids rocking it and whatnot, and maybe they're all... Maybe they are Red Sox fans in California. I don't know. I'm going to say probably not. Who knows? But they're all wearing that red beat, okay? And once again, we're going to talk about that later on. No one thing I say is an indicator someone's a gang member. I don't want people to make that mistake. If, if someone knew, if I knew what a gang member looked like, right, I wouldn't be here, right? I'd be a millionaire somewhere, right? <laughs> no one knows that. I don't know that, right? A lot of times we get a call. We'll say, hey, there's these kids on the corner. Maybe they have their pants you know, down, and they're walking, and they're talking, and they're acting a certain way, and people call all the time, hey, there's a bunch of gang members on the corner. I don't, I don't know. I, who knows, right? I, I don't know the answer to that, but, you know, we don't uh, assume that, and uh, we don't want anyone else to do that, too, all right? We'll, we'll talk about that. But these are just small pieces of the puzzle, if you will. And what's the, the three most active gangs we're looking at? The Killaby, Punk Village East, and the GBB Outlaws, all right? Um, those are the ones we look at. Those are the ones you probably read about in the paper. If you follow any of those, what's the violence? What does GB stand for? The GBB stand for? Redbrook Valley. Roughly, oh. how many members are there? I knew that. So we don't really have an, an accounting of that. We don't. It, it, that number would fluctuate depending on whether, you know, who knows if the kids move away or unfortunately someone gets killed or whatnot. We don't have an exact number. Um, so the Kilby kids, and, and they're, they're considered, for your purposes, they'd be like almost like on the west side, if you will, where Kilby Street is. That's kind of where they... We don't have a turf problem. We don't have turf wars, anything like that. But that's where this group is from, okay? Um, they, they go to Kilby kids, and you can see it right here. They're just doing the threes. So it's the three stripes. They would just throw it up like this, threes, right? Three stripes. They got that from the Adidas logo. The Adidas logo, three stripes. And there you go. You can see it right there. It says, stop snitching. And uh, that's just a, 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 a picture they posted. This is an interesting thing. This is the Kilby sign, right? Adidas logo. Does anyone notice something about in the middle of that? What is that? Does that spot get? What is that? Do you know what that? Why that is? Um, plumbing. Yeah, it's a disrespect to Plumley. She's right. So what? The, Plumley Village. So uh, that's a rival gang. So what they did is they made this logo, they put the upside down P, and it's kind of like a disrespect type thing. And uh, that just goes to show you some little ways some of these gang kids can't do that to communicate or whatnot. There we go. This is a, 
a thing from jail. It's a letter from jail, right? And you can see Maine South got the Kilby logo in it. So this person is sending out a, a, a request um, for some money, probably. But just going to show you how they can send something out of jail and get creative. PBE, the Plumber Village East. Uh, they, they, they're, they're enemies of the Kilby kids. Uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates, they'll represent with just, this, just the P, right? So they'll wear a Pittsburgh Pirates hat. We, have, we talked about that. This is what happens a lot of time, and this is once again across the country. You'll see these young kids, and they're throwing disrespect, they're throwing gang signs down, but they're, they're, their faces are, obviously I block their faces. On open source social media, their faces are not blocked. So what happens, a lot of these young kids may do this, put this out there, and we'll have violence as a result of this. Because they don't realize what they're doing. So they'll post it out there, someone will see that, and then it'll be a problem. Okay? But you can see how they're not hiding the face. They're not hiding it. You know, I, I did that for today. Because I didn't want someone to see their kid in there and go home and you know, have a problem. With Whatever. All right? So they're not hiding who they are when they're on social media. These are some kids, these are Greendale kids. I don't remember, we used to have the Connells, the Greendale Mall. And these guys here are kind of, I think, responsible for ending the Connells. Uh, violent group. And it's important to know this group, a lot of people think a lot of our gang members, or a lot of people, the gang members in general, are just inner city kids of color. That's not true. You can see these kids clearly are not. Uh, and these kids were violent gun kids. So the, the gang's culture, the gang itself, it's, it's, it affects every, every race, every neighborhood. I mean, people think because maybe they don't live in Worcester, there are no gang members in these towns. There certainly are, I can tell you there are. Or they get in the car, they drive, they go to Five Guys and choose to get a hamburger like I do. I like Five Guys. But uh, so people that think that they're, they're just not really being real with it, okay? So they, they are out, they're, they're all over, they're very transient. And once again, like I said, it's not a crime to be a gang member, okay? How did, how did they end the carnivals? Oh, the violence, the shootings. We had all the shootings over there. Oh, there were shootings. Yeah, we had some shootings over there. So at that point, it was just, we had to stop having the carnival. So the girls and gangs, right? We have very few all-girl gangs. The girls are just as violent. And the girls will usually hold the weapons or the drugs for the male gang members. All right? A lot of times what their philosophy on that is if they, if they get pulled over, they get stopped by the police, they're not going to search the females as they would search the males. Okay? Uh, a lot of these girls are victims as well. They get caught up in these relationships with these kids. Um, and they're victims of uh, domestic violence and things like that. And... Uh, that's, that's, it's tough for them, the, the girls in these gangs, okay? Don't get me wrong, some of them can be violent. Um, they'll commit assaults, they'll do different things like that. But a lot of these girls, they get caught up with these, these gang members and uh, the, the gang kids will use them, they'll use the apartment. Uh, if the girl has an apartment, they like to use that apartment maybe to sell drugs out of it or whatnot. And they won't have anything in with their name on it. The, the gang members will not. Um, they're extremely smart. They know how to manipulate that system. This was a female homicide victim. This case is still open. This was, uh, this was a tragedy, this young girl. Uh, she was shot in the big white pocket lot. Um, it just goes to show you that it does affect males and females, okay? Uh, I knew this young girl, and uh, that, that's a tragedy. The four basic cues, right? So if you want to know, hey, for whatever purpose, I don't know, your kid or whatever, these are some basic things that, that you would use for a, a self. First thing you want to do, if you want to know if someone's a gang member, a lot of these Boys and girls, if you said, I don't know this cat right here, if I say, hey, are you a gang member? He's going to look at me and go, yeah. Right? Especially if you're not a police officer in a uniform, right? Yeah. Someone goes up to this guy and says, hey, are you a gang member? Yeah, I am. I'm from New York. I killed 25 people. Right? They want that bravado, right? Mm -hmm. That's probably not true, but they're going to tell you that, right? Right? They're all going to be the biggest, baddest person on the street. So if you really want them to know, just ask. All right? Because like I told you, it's not against the law. All right? The national kids will tell you right up front, I am. I'm a Latin king, you know, my dad was a Latin king, you know, I'm from New York, or whatever, whatever they may be, they'll tell you their story. So what age are they no longer eligible to be in a gang? There is no such thing. I mean, can you be 45 years old and still be in a whoa, gang? Whoa, 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 was 45 old now? No, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, old. I'm 60. You want to wheel me out? <laughs> but they're not kids. Huh? No, so... Kids. No, no, so they're a gang, they're a, so 
in yeah, the gang life. Again. Okay, so you once you're in, you're in. Okay, uh, you can obviously if you become a homicide victim or whatever, but that that status is for life. A lot of them, the older gang kids, they'll age out, but they're always they're in it for life. The the easiest way I think to look at it is the I'm sure you've all heard the term "I am my brother's keeper." That term is true. So if if, if you're a, 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 a a gang member, if you're a Latin king, for instance, then you're a Latin king for life until you disrespect the group or you get killed. Mm -hmm. So we have some gang members that are as old as me. Okay. So that's a, does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. So you don't really age out. Okay. What we are seeing nationally across the country now is that we're seeing a lot of younger kids, gang members. We're seeing younger kids with guns. We're seeing younger kids shooting people. We're seeing younger kids getting shot. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that now, okay? Along those lines, is there a typical age where they would stop recruiting? So if somebody who was 45 said, hey, I want to join, they'd, uh, they'd go away, old man? <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, yeah. <laughs> By 45, if you're not in, you ain't getting in, right? So, because you know, a lot of these kids will get in a little younger, but that, that's a good question. But can you get out? Are there yeah. dues, expectations, <laughs> things that you're expected to do on behalf? So the, 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 the easiest answer to that is to commit crime. So when we're talking about gangs, we're talking about criminal gangs, right? We're talking about, the, so you'd have to be involved committing crime with the group. So let's Whether it be assault, a robbery, whatever, sell drugs. If I was committing a, committing a crime, getting some monetary value, yep. I mean, is this like a kickback sort of thing? It could be, depending on your, sometimes they're all independent. So that question, it, it could be either, if you, uh, for instance, if you're a national gang, they may have you give money to the, to the gang itself. If you're in a local street gang, you may all be in it together. You know, maybe I'm selling you the drugs, and I'm making my profit, then you're selling it. You know what I'm saying? But uh, the, the 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 nexus there is crime, right? These gangs are committing crimes. Okay. You consider them, and maybe maybe was there some are a business network almost, or or is it a social network? What do you what do you kind of or is it they're, the they're criminals. So what 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 the ones I deal with? So we deal with criminal street gangs, okay? So these kids, they um, they don't run a legitimate business, okay? So they're committing crimes. So all their money is is uh, gained from crimes, whether it be drugs, identity theft. A lot of people don't realize that. That's a big thing amongst gang members now, okay? They do the identity theft. They steal your credit card. They do all that. So they're not like um, the ones I encounter um, are not like running a legitimate business. There are some, I'm sure, nationally, some larger gangs, but uh, in the street gangs and the, these smaller gangs, these local gangs, uh, the majority of them are committed crimes. Okay, that's how we define them. And that's how we follow them. I mean, they may own a legitimate business, uh, try to make some money or whatever, but they're still out there committing crime. Okay, all right. That's why they stay in that world, if you will. They're criminals. The motorized three wheelers, the motorcycles. Is yeah. that is that what is is that a show? What, what is yeah, that? that's not something. That's not. I can't say they're gang members that ride those. That maybe somebody else will come in and define that for you. But uh, we, I don't. We don't really deal with a lot of that. I'm sure some of those kids maybe they are gang members like dirt bikes. But uh, that's more that bike life thing. It's it's just bored. Bored. Just bored. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, that's just the bike life well, thing. But so, that. but don't get me wrong. Yeah. Some of the, I mean, I've had cases where they've had a, a, a road rage and one of those kids take out a gun and shot somebody. So, you know, you know what I'm saying? So that's that. So tattoos, if you see some tattoos, um, you know, guns blaring, like I showed you, the Latin King one or something like that. Scarring. Most of our kids, these gang kids, they've been involved in violence, right? So they've been previously got a gunshot, uh, a bullet hole. It doesn't like heal and go away. You'll see the indent. Stab, stabbing, scarring. So you're looking for that scarring, tattoos, and then association, you know, if... if if you're talking to a young individual or a gang member and they keep saying, well, I'm not really a Latin king, I just hang out with them, that's really not true, all right? Don't, don't, don't buy that story, you know, because um, they're not going to allow someone to hang out with them that's not part of the group that's not committing the crimes because they wouldn't trust that person, right? So you have to be on point to that. But those are some of the basic ones you can look at. Just simply ask them. Those are the things you look at. And like I said, nobody can look at someone and say that person is a gang member. Nobody knows. I could bring a kid in here right now. Uh, I knew this one kid, uh, nicest kid, 
young man, uh, played in our Pal Basketball League. If I brought him in here right now, everyone would be oh my God, what a great kid, oh my God, very, very clean cut, good looking kid, bop, bop, bop. And uh, unfortunately, he shot somebody in the head. But if I brought him in here, you're not going to look at him and go, oh my God, you know, I, this kid is, so that's not true, that's a fallacy. You, you can't tell by looking at somebody, okay? So we don't want you to get caught up in that. We don't do that, and we don't expect anyone else to do that. Social media is huge. Those of you who uh, ha have kids that are of that age between, unfortunately, 13 to 20-something, social media is huge for these kids. It's a big influence uh, with the gang kids, right? The kids with the lowest social skills, they may go on and act like a gang member, right? We've had crimes across the country where a kid maybe goes on a website, starts talking about like he's a gang member or she's a gang member and she's really not, and the real gang members see that, and they could have a problem, okay? Post pitches, videos, they shouldn't. That's still a problem. We have to talk to our kids today, right, about putting stuff out on the uh, internet. Uh, especially young girls today, they get influenced and they, they post things they shouldn't, and then someone may control them with a picture they, they, put, they put out there. The gang members will take advantage of these followers. Like I said, they're looking for the weak, they're looking for the people that want to join. They need a lot of little followers to sell the drugs, do the dirty work, if you will, but that's what they're looking for, okay? Social media, your own social media, um, your kids' social media, you know, age appropriate. You know, you want to watch what, what your kids are doing on social media today, who they're talking to, what they're doing, you know. Um, yourselves, you, you got to be careful what you do today, right? I don't have any social media. I don't put anything out on the, on the social media. I don't have any accounts or anything like that. Your phones, we all have iPhones and whatnot. And with a search warrant, we can open your iPhone, we can look in your iPhone. Um, we do it all the time, once again, with a search warrant. And a lot of these young kids don't, don't understand that concept. You know, we'll have kids that'll go on social media and they'll post a gun. You know, we'll have a, a young boy or girl go on there and have a gun. I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna take care of this, I'm gonna do it right on social media. And when I first started seeing this, I was like, wow, this is crazy. And they'll do it. And then what do we do? We do the investigation. We would then freeze the account, right? And we can then track it down and hopefully we can get that gun off the street, okay? But the social media is a big problem. We have a lot of kids fighting over social media, right? Someone posts something, right? Like those pictures I showed you, the kids throwing gang signs. Someone calls someone a punk, someone calls someone a snitch on social media. That can lead to violence, okay? Videos. If your kids or you know someone's maybe making some videos, watch the video, listen to what they're singing, what they're saying. You know, if, they, if they're saying stuff like, hey, you know, you got one of ours, we're gonna get one of yours. You know what I'm saying? So-and-so's a rat, so-and-so's a snitch. Those are the things you wanna look for, okay? In your own personal whatever. That's what we do. And that's how we hope we can prevent the violence. So I'm gonna show you some of the weapons. A lot of times you'll see, does everyone have any questions on that? I know I went fast. Got it. Do you, and this, this may be a separate unit, but do we, do we, do we have issues with, and or do you deal with Big larger organized crime here in Worcester, so like the uh, Italian mafia, for example. I'm not sure. You know, mm -hmm. I know that they're still around. I, I do not. So I'm mostly street gang. Okay. Um, I do not. So that'd be like a white collar type thing. We we have mechanisms in place. We can do that, but as of now, we have nothing going with that. Our largest large organization, something like that, would be like the Hell's Angels. Okay. These gangs, they um, accept any race. Yes. To join the right. They do. They do. I mean, you might have something where, you know, they might, how do I say that? I guess you shouldn't say all the time, but my experience has been, yes, there will be mixed races within these gangs, okay? If someone can bring you in, all right? That was a good question. Anything else? Um, so the gangs tend to stay in their own neighborhoods, or? Not really, they're very transient. They're driving around, they're all over the city. They may have an area where they started, or a base, like if we use the east side, kids would stay on the east side. But having said that, they will travel over to the west side. And unless there's an ongoing problem, or a recent dispute, a recent shooting, they could travel, get a pass, if you will, to use that term, a pass. They could travel over there. Some of these, maybe, maybe I'm, a, maybe I'm a, a west side gang member, and I have a baby on the east side. Uh, I'll be able to travel and see my, my child. But if there was a recent problem, a recent shooting, or I had a personal problem with somebody, then that wouldn't happen, right? So these kids, they, they have to travel cautiously, I will say, the active ones. Because remember one thing too, to use a term, old beef never dies, right? 
I knew a kid, he got caught. He was a gang kid, did some violent crimes, went to prison. I think he did five to seven at least. Got out of prison, they shot and killed him the next day. It now old beef never dies, and these young kids don't get that. You can't live in Worcester, a small city like Worcester, and be robbing people, shooting people, stabbing people, right? Doing people wrong, and then all of a sudden say, you know what, I'm done with that. Yeah. That's not gonna happen. That's just being real. You have to move. One, one follow-up question. So when they put their uh, gang symbol like on a street sign, mm -hmm. in, by Worcester State or something, and uh, what's the reason for marking? We, we don't see a lot of that graffiti anymore. Uh, so we don't see a lot of that territorial tagging anymore. Um, so they don't really do that anymore. anymore. They won't. I mean, they may, for whatever reason, put something up or whatever. Uh, but we don't see a lot of that territorial tagging. Okay? Like I said, they do have areas that they consider where they're from or where they grew up. And if you saw a rival member there and there's an ongoing issue, there will be a shooting. Does everyone get that? Am I making sense to everyone what I'm saying? So it's not a, it's not a, uh, a constant. It's not like you can't ever go here. You know, you have to be smart. Because some of these gang kids, we have relatives. We could have cousins that are rival in rival gangs. And they're cousins. You know what I'm saying? And they're going to still be cousins. You know what I'm saying? But if something happens, there's a problem. Okay? Does that answer your questions? Any other questions on that? One last. I'm sorry. Go ahead, man. I've asked too many. No, no, that's right. Go ahead. What could a hate group be? classify this again? Yeah, yep, yep, absolutely. More so more you could have like here. some skinheads, some white supremacists, absolutely, yep, absolutely, yep. Currently right now, um, we only have one small faction of that we're kind of watching, but that's it, here in Worcester. I can only speak to Worcester. How do you handle it like in the schools? That's a great question, mm -hmm. especially now, right? Um, so, uh, if we get a complaint, we have school resource officers that would then deal with it. So we don't, we wouldn't be in the school for getting in it, so ourselves. Anything else? You, you mentioned a while ago you used to go We used to go sixth to sixth graders. grade, correct. We used to do every sixth grade, and like I told you my story. So we would have a, a gang unit officer, and if they had a story to tell, we'd go in to talk to sixth grade kids and say, hey, like in my case, I grew up in Lincoln Village, this is what I grew up, this, this is the real deal. We kind of talk to them, this is what's really going on. And we found that when they see an officer from like the gang unit or the vice squad or uh, you know, the operations division coming into their school, they're like, oh my God, I saw that guy. He, he, unfortunately, he raided my neighbor's house. I, that guy, I saw that guy, he was at a shooting. He was just, so there's a little, you can relate. And we'll come in and we'll talk to him. And uh, that's what we used to do. Any but other questions? Do it now. We do not do it anymore. Any other questions? All right. So this is just some of the weapons we're seeing. Kind of, you guys can kind of see it and see like, because you hear all about ghost guns and whatnot. I don't, someone else gonna come in and do guns with you or something, or maybe some I don't know. But I'll show you what 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 the gang units what we're getting for weapons. And these are anything from kids 12 years old all the way up to old people that are in their 40s. <laughs> Even an old guy like me wants to have a gun. Sergeant Roach, I have one follow-up question. With this. Yeah. Shootings? Of the shootings in the city, yeah. what percent do, would you say are related to gangs? Uh, I don't have that number, and I'm not trying... I, I don't know. There are people that track that. I would say it's high. It's high. I would say that. I think I'm comfortable saying that. It's a high number of gang... The shootings, gang-related, I would say high. I would say definitely high. Okay. Thanks. Yep. So this is a gun, and I'm not a huge gun guy, believe it or not. Some of you may be gun experts or whatever, but this is like a little 380. I don't, we probably should have lowered the lights. I don't think that, but but yeah. uh, that's a little 380, a semi-automatic that was just in the waistband of a 15-year-old kid. But that gun will kill you just as easy as anything else. This here, this is just a, a standard semi-automatic, but the key here is, the, can you guys see that? Okay, so this is the extended clip. So a lot of times you might hear extendo or extended clip. So what they're saying is if you look at the back of my gun, I can't pull it up, but see right here, there's no, where this hangs out? Yeah. That just gives you extra rounds in the magazine, okay? This gun right here, uh, it's a large capacity, it's a 22, and I think it was 80 rounds. This gun was able to fire. Young man had that and some ammunition. This is an interesting weapon right here. If you notice, one, it's a large capacity, right? So that's 30-something bullets. It's, uh, I think this is a 
40 or a 45, I'm not sure. But the interesting thing with this is the shoelace around the gun. Do you notice that? Yeah. Anyone know why that is? Mm -hmm. So they can wear it around their neck. They can put that gun right around their neck, right? So unfortunately, if the police search, maybe they wouldn't find it, or maybe they could have the hand inside a, a, a sweatshirt, right? Have the hand right on the gun and you would not know it. There's a, this is a ghost gun inside of a, a fanny pack. Uh, you can see the magazine is out of the weapon. Now, we don't handle the weapons. I'm sure someone from crime scene is going to come in here at some point. So we see a gun like this, we stop, they come and they handle the weapon. Okay, the crime scene people. There you go, there's a ghost gun. So that gun is, is made, um, this particular kid made the gun, he decided to put blue, you probably can't see it. It's got a blue trigger, uh, it's got a blue slide. But once again, it's got the extended clip, right? So the common thing you're seeing is they all like the extended clips. It gives them more rounds, okay? So this gun was built and someone built this gun, they ordered the parts online, and that's basically what a ghost gun is. That's all it is. It's, it's still illegal. It's still, you know, just as dangerous as a regular gun, but they have both. So in my world, we're getting both. We get guns that are uh, stolen, um, straw purchase from other states that these gang kids have. So they have guns. They have a gun that would be like a Glock or Smith & Wesson with serial numbers. They don't have a ghost gun without serial numbers. However they can get it, okay? You can order a ghost gun online. Like, only the parts. Only, only the parts. So let's talk about that because I don't want because this is a hot issue. So what happens is you can go online, right? And um, you could order all the parts for this particular weapon. And you could build the gun. Until you drill it out, and I'm not a gun expert, okay? Until you drill it out, maybe Paul knows better than I don't know. Until you drill that gun out, it's not a working firearm, okay? So you can possess all the parts of a gun. Am I making sense? Yeah. So you can, the gun breaks apart in all these different parts. You order all the parts, you then assemble it, and then you can, uh, until you drill it out, it's not a working firearm. So really, realistically, there is no crime until the gun becomes a working firearm, okay? So yes, and anybody can build it. Because you can go on, you can go on Google, uh, you can go on YouTube or whatever to show you to do it, and they even tell you they'll sell you the right drill. They sell you a template, so you can buy all the parts. You put the template, you can drill the holes and, and do all that. There goes another one. You can see it. There goes the clip. This one's red. So this particular kid made his gun red. And these guns are all off the body. So these are, we took these off somebody. Okay. So it wasn't like we just found these in the street, all right? And they're carrying them like that in their pants or in their holster, you know what I'm saying? Um, and you can see that big clip, okay? Which is dangerous, right? Carrying a gun without a holster is dangerous, right? Because, I, I mean, I've seen it happen. You got sweatpants on, your gun falls down in your sweatpants, right? Now you go to grab it, you shoot yourself. You can shoot yourself in a bad spot, right? <laughs> <laughs> you shoot yourself at all. And then you go grab it, you're like, oh, God! <laughs> You know, is, is so there any good shot to spot the sheet yourself? Well, I know it was a bad spot. If you grab it at the waist and you pull the trigger, that's going to be a bad day. That'll be a bad day for you. This is, I don't know if this will play. This is what you're seeing. You're seeing the term or hearing the term Glock, Glock switch. It's not made by Glock. This is, a, a, this is what it does. It takes my gun or any gun and makes it fully automatic. These are the weapons we're getting. Now, this is a police officer shooting this who works with me, and I'll show you how it works. Thank you. Thank you. Here we go. So, that... That's like 15 rounds in two seconds, right? This is a typical... This is what you can see. This is a typical shooting that we'll get. Um, this is uh, what we'll respond to. That young man came home and was shot at. All right, so we'll take that case, we'll investigate that case, and hopefully we can uh, solve that particular case. In 2023, we had 41 people shot. We had five fatal shootings. So yeah. a lot of times people will say, what's that, sorry? Gang-related? Uh, all, that's all. Oh, that's, okay. not, that's all, okay? And so a lot of people say, well, wait a minute. 40 people got shot and only five died. And they'll say, why? Are they bad shots? What's going on? My own opinion, a lot of it is, uh, a lot of our victims are young, uh, they're in 
not old like me and the 42 year old and, <laughs> and a lot of times they're shot and, and if you live in Worcester UMass is a level one trauma yeah. our, pa our ambulances are all two, two person fully operated paramedics I've been on scene with, with, with victims and, and I really literally said you know tell me what happened you know you're not going to make it and uh, they'll be bleeding out the neck shot in the head and they live so clearly I'll never make it as a doctor because I can't figure <laughs> this, this out whatsoever. But uh, UMass is the one that uh, oh, is a big part of it. It depends where you're hit, obviously. Mm -hmm. you know, but I've seen people shot in the head and survive. I've seen people shot in the neck and survive. I've seen a young man shot in the chest where it actually uh, damaged part of his aorta and he survived. You know? But then again, it's life, right? I've seen someone shot in the, in the buttocks area and hit a main artery and die. So you just can't figure that out. That's why we try to tell these young kids, don't, don't play that game. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen they go to shoot somebody in the arm, right? A lot of uh, victims, they're shot in the arm, and what happens? The bullet goes through your arm, into your chest, and kills you. Mm -hmm. You know, so you just don't understand it. But that's kind of where, where that comes from, on that. And I think... And by the way, level one is university. Yeah. I'm sorry? Mass University is level one. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so level one trauma. It's a level one trauma, right? Because they're saving people, you know? And, um, you know, because I have to go in there. And I have somewhat a little bit of a weak stomach. And one day, I do, I go in there one day and this person is stabbed and I'm in there and I just ate an eggplant sandwich. You ever see eggplant? They, <laughs> so I eat the eggplant sandwich and I'm, and I'm in there and it's like hot in there and, and, and I'm looking. And I'm looking at this person stabbed and thinking, wow, it looks like the eggplant. <laughs> and you know how the bright lights in there, right? They got the bright light, the heat. And the doctor who knew me goes, Sandra George, you're going to be okay? I goes, Oh, I don't know, man. I ate that eggplant sandwich. I'm, not gonna <laughs> I'm gonna have to come back. He goes, yeah, come back because you ain't looking too good. Even the even the person stabs like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, oh, I'll stop. I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> so, but UMass is saving a lot of people, and I don't work for UMass. They're just saving a lot of people. We're gonna go through our programs real quick. And I, what are we doing for time here? Okay, so. The, the gang unit, we do a summer camp, all right? So we have 300 kids from the city. They're not gang members. People, just because they call it gang, gang they're, they're not all three, they're not gang members, okay? They're kids from the city, and uh, we have them for three weeks. It's uh, staffed by members of the gang unit. We also have people from the Boys and Girls Club. We run a Pal Basketball League. This is our oldest and most probably successful program. We do 80 kids three times a year, 13 to 18. Uh, it's all males. Uh, we will let females play, but right now it's mostly all males. The PAL boxing, we do the boxing. And then we do trips to the DC Youth Center, right? We'll take the kids, the DC Youth Center is a great part of it. We'll take the kids there, they love the monster trucks, they love wrestling, the young kids. And like I said, this is part of our intervention and prevention where we're just trying to get these kids to see the police in a different side and hope we get them not to join a gang. Because in this, the camp, you guys, I love the camp, because some of these kids, that's their summer vacation. That one week with us, and it's not, and then we take them, we take them on good field trips, we give them a cookout, it's, you know, we put them in, we make them all come together. So if we have a young kid say, hey, I'm from Lakeside, I can't be with this kid from the Valley, we don't allow that. All right, we're all in it together. We're, 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 and, and, it's, and it's been successful, I'm proud of the group, um, and we've been doing it a long time. And it's a great thing for these kids, it really, really is. Go ahead. Um, do you have to pay for the summer camp if you have No, all our programs are free. All our programs are free. And all the, the, the programs, you have to go through like a Boys and Girls Club or something and because um, obviously we wouldn't be able to sustain that if we just, but if you wanted to put somebody in there, if you sent an email to me or somebody, we would we would put that person in for you, okay? I can even play in the basketball no more. Huh? I can even play pal no more. Did you used to play in the pal? Awesome, there you go. So here's our pal, all right, young man playing it. This is what we're doing here at the St. Bernard's Church. We use uh, referees, we use official referees, high school referees, certified referees. We want these kids to have a good experience, right? So we want to make sure that they, they have a great time there. It's a great program. There you go. This young man right here, this guy talking to the kids. We do this, we do as much as you can. He played for the um, Pirates, this kid here. And he's now the athletic director at BC High. He, uh, in his professional career, he went to BC College, played football. He played with um, Matt Ryan from the NFL. And this kid played for the Washington Redskins, and he came out and talked to our kids. So we try to bring mentors into these kids to say, hey, listen, man. And one kid said to this young man, he goes, well, you didn't make it in the NFL. You didn't make it in the NFL. He said, yeah, but listen to me. I went to school for free for four years. That was, they gave me $200,000 to go to college. And then I got to play on the practice squad for the Washington Redskins. 
and I made hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, you know what I'm saying? It's nice for these kids to hear that. Because they, they were looking at him like, well, maybe he's a failure. He didn't make it to you. And this kid's like, no, I'm not a failure. I had a great life. And now look at him now. He's the athletic director at BC High. And he's a great kid. And you look at him, he's a big strapping kid. He comes in and, and it just, that's what these kids need to, they need to hear that. They need to hear from people like that. So they can look at it and say, man, you know what? This is what you need to do. And so that's what we do with the PAL. And you were in the PAL, so you know we, we kind of do what we got to do. This is part of the camp. These are some pictures you can see these kids. This is where we had the horses. We had the state police and our uh, horses there. Some of these kids have never seen a horse before. That is the best. They walk up to like, Grr. then after about 10 minutes, they're slapping it on the bud, and they're just going like, oh, on the bus. <laughs> There's Jerry's ice cream. We got to have Jerry at the camp for the kids. This was great. This is a great story, and then I'm going to get out of here so the next person can come in. So this is the UMass uh, Life Flight helicopter, okay? So every year, we try to land the state police helicopter. One year, we had a black cop come from the military. Anyone here in the military? Anyone see a black cop live in person? Okay, you have, right? I so I'm not a military. I don't know nothing about it. So the black cop, the, the Army guy, says, hey, have all the people go over to the basketball court. We're on Cambridge Street. So I'm going, all right. That black cop came in, right? It's like, oh. Uh. My heart was, I'm like, what is happening right now? That hell, right? The guy jumps off. It was amazing. So uh, once the, uh, whatever the change were politically, we no longer get a black cop helicopter. So we use a state police helicopter. So they come in, the troopers come in, and they do a great job because the kids love it. I love it. So now what happens? The state police helicopter is not available. So I got to go to UMass. I go in. I get out to the helicopter. They have like a helicopter area. You go in there. So I get in there. I says, hey, can we get the helicopter to come to the camp on Wednesday? The lady goes, are you kidding me? I go, no, we need the helicopter for the kids. She goes, so you want the UMass helicopter to come and land for the kids for the camp? I said, yeah. She goes, who are you? I said, <laughs> <laughs> she, so she goes, hold on a minute. So out comes the pilot, right? Because then Donnie comes out and he goes, can I help you? I goes, yeah, you know, we, do, we, do, we need the helicopter for the kids. You know, we got no helicopter. He goes, all right, well, I'm going to need a diagram of the landing area. I said, no problem. Give me a pen. I take it. He goes, he goes, are you for real? I go, what? I goes, this is the thing. This is the basketball court. Land right here. He goes, all right, we'll take care of it. Goes, we'll come. And they came. And oh, the kids, and the kids loved it. And they sent the, I don't, I'm sure they're all great, but the crew they sent were phenomenal. And uh, they came in and they landed it. And you could see them just shaking their head like, but they loved it. The people that, that came with that particular helicopter, they loved it. They were great. I want to say, you may, do you work at UMass? Is that it? Or? I work uh, by the UMass. Yeah. So, oh, there, oh, there you go. Yeah. So, so UMass, I, I believe they have a pilot, a nurse, and it's a, it's a three man crew, it's, three person it's crew. Usually it's two medics. Yeah. And well, they all have to be certified. Yeah. Like certified. Yeah. Because that's what I want to do, and I can do it. Yeah. Because I they, need my medic. They uh, they come on. The crew came out, and the kids love them. You can see they're in there. Let them go in there. They they stay for lunch. Uh, does there any other questions or anything like that? No. Perfect. Uh, oh, sorry. How often do you guys do that? The boxing. So we tried to do two fights a year, but right now we're we're going through some things with USA Boxing, and we're hoping we can get it up for next year. Get a fight. And anybody can fight. Um, it's just we have to go through USA Boxing now. It's a whole different thing. Uh, no other questions? Everything's good? If you have a question that's really bothering you or if you want to answer something, you can email me here. I'm sure you have the police email. It's just you got to do Roach S because there are other people saying last name. All right? Thank you very much. Hopefully you got something out of it. Uh, you can take it. And use it uh, I'm Sergeant Brennan Tipton with the Worcester Police Vice Squad, and this is one of my vice uh, detectives that works with me. We're going to go over the uh, the vice squad today, what we do, a little bit how we do it, and uh, why we do it. And uh, So uh, an overall view of the vice squad, which is our, the City of Worcester's um, drug unit. Our mission is a violation of narcotic laws and prostitution. Uh, we focus on street-level dealers, mid-level retail distributors, and high-level drug traffickers. Street-level dealing um, is when we focus on low-level <coughs> dealers who are impacting the quality of life in our neighborhoods. That's some of the uh, open-air drug dealers you might see in certain parts of the city. Uh, oftentimes, this street-level drug dealing results in crimes of violence, including stabbing, shooting, robberies, amongst rival drug dealers and customers. 
Uh, many of these low-level dealers may be users themselves and are selling to support their habit. Uh, we get a lot of tips through our text a tip program, which we follow up uh, every tip that comes in, uh, along with like neighborhood watch groups and uh, people who will call in straight to the vice squad and uh, let us know if there's a house in a certain neighborhood that's popped up that started to deal drugs or uh, if there's a, a certain street corner or business, something like that, and follow it up that way. <clears throat> During the street level dealing enfor enforcement, we use confidential informants, uh, street level surveillance by myself and other vice detectives, along with utilizing undercover police officers. High level traffickers, uh, this is when we target individuals who are supplying the mid level and low level dealers. Uh, we work alongside the Mass Massachusetts State Police, the local DEA task force, and other federal agencies. Uh, we have a great relationship with all the federal agencies, uh, surrounding towns along with the state police. We work together to uh, for these high level traffickers. Doing these type of investigations, uh, we utilize confidential informants, undercover officers, uh, all the way up to wiretap investigations, which are long term uh, investigations that we have done. Methods of distribution that we see out in the streets of Worcester, uh, large quantities of drugs are shipped through the mail, FedEx, uh, UPS, etc. A lot of times they will use a legitimate business as a front for, uh, for, for the dealing, whether it's a restaurant, barbershop, auto body shop, but along with, you know, they'll sell out of their car, they'll sell out of their house, apartment, etc. A lot of the organized groups that we see use dispatcher organizations, uh, meaning if you're uh, a buyer, you'll call the number that you've used, that number will call, you know, the next person, and that person will dispatch a dealer to you so you can get your product. Types of narcotics that we see, uh, there are some pictures in here, but uh, towards the end in that box, we have uh, various, various drugs that you guys can be able to see in real life. Uh, in Massachusetts, there are five different classifications of narcotics with uh, Mass General Law Class A, B, C, D, and E. Uh, it's all based according to their chemical composition and effect on the human body, uh, stimulants, depressants, and hallucinogenic effects. Class A, which would be your heroin, fentanyl, and carfentanyl. This is probably our biggest drug that we see here in the city. Uh, fentanyl has kind of superseded heroin. Uh, without an absolute statistic, I would say fentanyl, uh, uh, excuse me, heroin is probably almost obsolete now <coughs> in, uh, in this area, and fentanyl is the uh, drug of choice for sellers and buyers at this point. Why is that? We'll get into that. It's a great question. Uh, class B, that'll be cocaine, codeine, methadone, uh, along with prescription pills like Oxycontin, Oxycodone, Percocet, crack cocaine, which is made from cocaine, and MDMA. Class C, we don't see a lot of this, but this would be like your mushrooms, which is the psilocybin, Valium, synthetic marijuana. Have you, there was a request from the Human Rights Commission that the city consider deprioritizing the psilocybin, is that come to the police department at all? That would be above me. Um, I'm sure if they made that request, that it, it'll be handled uh, at the administrative level. Um, the synthetic marijuana, that actually is not testable uh, when it goes to the state lab, so it kind of comes back as nothing anyways. Uh, we don't really see a lot of that, and we don't really have a method of enforcing it because of that. Class D is marijuana. <clears throat> and Class E is basically all other prescription pills that don't fall into the other categories um, that people are illegally uh, either ha have on their persons or using. Uh, these are compounds with small percentage of codeine, morphine, opium. Uh, but yeah, I would ju that's just basically any other prescription pill uh, that we see on the street. 
related crimes, uh, a lot of our search warrants will lead to an investigation will lead to firearm recoveries. Um, and again, earlier we talked about the trickle effects of car breaks and robberies, stabbings um, between rival drug dealers uh, and drug users. Heroin, it's an illegal, highly addictive, extremely dangerous substance derived from morphine and opium. Uh, it depresses the central nervous system and also causes respiratory depression, constricted pupils, and nausea. What does heroin look like? In its purest form, it's white. But most heroin that we find in this area is tan or brownish color. Uh, that's because of the derivatives that are put into the heroin so that the seller can make more money and just sell more. Uh, lately, an interesting trend we've seen towards the end of last year and earlier today, uh, we've seen purple heroin, and it's like a bright, bright purple. The history of heroin use uh, was first manufactured in 1898 by Bayer Pharmaceutical Company. It was marketed as a non-addictive morphine substitute and most of it comes from Afghanistan and Mexico. How it is used, the most common is injection, but also snorting, smoking, and orally. That's what we would see on the street, um, a regular everyday today user. Um, like you can see in the picture, it's basically the size of a penny. What would that quantity be called? A, four, uh, a 20 bag. A 20 bag? Yeah. And with that, someone's going to, like a repeat user, someone that's in the street that uses a, on a regular basis is going to try to get as many bags of those as they can throughout a day. Again, that's broken up out of the bag. Some of the paraphernalia, we'll also be able to see it in the, our little kit that we have, but the spoon is used to take that powder, you put a lighter under it, mix it into a liquid form, you can inject it. We also see uh, a lot of individuals using uh, snorting as a technique for the heroin. Needles, hypodermic needles. Pricing and weight, like an old dose, uh, 0 0.03 grams was for $10. Now you can, for $40, you can get almost 10 times as much as that. Per gram, about $100. 10 grams, which is a finger of heroin, between seven and $800. And a kilogram is uh, about $65,000. A kilogram, if we see that on the street, that will be certainly one of our high level dealers. Fentanyl. It's a powerful synthetic opiate, similar to but more potent than morphine. It's 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine and 30 to 50 times more potent than heroin. Uh, it's typically used to treat patients with severe pain or to manage pain after surgery. When used legitimately, it is typically seen as a transdermal patch. Um, if anyone's been in the labor and delivery room, that's uh, what's used there. Why fentanyl, to answer your question? It's easier to mass produce uh, in labs in Mexico and China. Uh, it's cheaper to make. It's versatile, it can be snorted, injected, eaten, or worn as a patch. And the profit of fentanyl, you can see at the bottom, one kilo of fentanyl is 80 to 100 kilos of heroin. Similar appearance to heroin, color and texture. Um, like I was saying, fentanyl is basically is taken over for the opiate of choice. Uh, said in 2021, 75 percent of overdose death toxicology reports came back positive for fentanyl. Uh, at that time, users were kind of unaware of the varying strengths and imprecise cutting meaning you have you know, pure fentanyl, it gets cut up with different cutting agents.
to get distributed and you know the the users aren't aware of what the dealers are putting in to the fentanyl which is going to vary the strength of it that's when when we see it like a spike in overdoses say in like a week's period it can be attributed to you know one major dealer that's cutting it with something that's causing these overdoses if that makes sense like I said, um, most of our recent seizures of suspected heroin are coming back as pure fentanyl, uh, and we focus our investigative efforts on those who are distributing fentanyl. Typical dose. Prescription drugs, uh, one of our biggest problems, particularly with our youth and recreational users, are the prescription drugs. Doesn't have the same stigma as using heroin or fentanyl, whether it's injecting, uh, buying it out in the street, um, recreational use can quickly turn into an addiction and it's uh, this is the true getaway drug that we see like an individual say college age high school age will start with this and uh, they'll graduate to using heroin and fentanyl because the price of prescription drugs is significantly higher than the price of heroin and fentanyl the dangers uh, pills become expensive they sell by the milligram they quickly can lead to users turning into a cheaper alternative also counterfeit pills are being made by those with access to pill presses and raw material and many of those pills come back testing for heroin or fentanyl uh, in the last couple of years we've had a handful of seizures that of thousands and thousands of pills with a pill press uh, they're, they're being sold on the street <coughs> as oxy um, but they're coming back as pure fentanyl. So someone that it might be addicted to Oxycontin, they like to enjoy the high or they're using it for self-medication, they might take that pill of fentanyl and overdose not knowing that they took fentanyl thinking it was something else. And as you can see, this is kind of like one of those uh, old school like, uh, like dare commercials that like, you know, why do kids like drugs? Well, it looks like candy, and uh, but all those pills came back as pure fentanyl. And there's a lot, the, the draw to that for drug dealers mm -hmm. is because you can make a lot, a lot of money. You're selling an oxy, uh, 80 milligram Percocet for $80, where it probably only cost them 80, 80 cents to make. So the profit for dealers is uh, significant. <coughs> Addressing the problem. From our perspective as uh, the Vice Squad and the Worcester Police Department as a whole, we must address the opiate epidemic from both an enforcement and a public health approach. We recognize that those suffering from addiction are in need of our help, and our crisis intervention team has been working to get many of those people the help that they need. They particularly focus on those with co-occurring conditions such as homelessness, drug abuse, mental illness, and victimization. Our CIT team works with users and assists with getting them into the appropriate programs. Uh, overdose statistics are tracked uh, every week. Our CIT officers then conduct follow-up investigations by reviewing incident reports from overdoses. They obtain phone numbers and addresses of family members, spouses, friends, and use this information to try to get those individuals the help that they need. Well, we do have those programs to assist those addicted in opiates. We are a law enforcement agency, and we must deal with the crimes that we're presented with, including uh, home and car breaks, commercial breaks, copper theft, shoplifting, street robberies, prostitution, drug dealing, uh, all the way up to including murder that we often see that are associated with drug dealing and drug use. Some of our stats uh, over the last couple of years well, just the last year, uh, we've seized over 13,000 uh, grams of fentanyl, thousands of counterfeit uh, oxy pills that are coming back as fentanyl, 5,000 grams of cocaine, uh, over half a million dollars in money. Uh, last year, we had 111 arrests. We executed 56 search warrants with 27 firearms recovered. Before I open it up to questions, uh, just the Vice Squad, we. We uh, work two shifts. We have a day shift and a night shift. There's about 20 officers total. Um, we're an investigative unit that falls in investigative services along with the detective bureau and the gang unit, the crime scene unit. But 
you guys have any questions regarding anything that we talked about tonight? I do. Good. What is car fentanyl? It's just another uh, opiate that we saw coming back in some of the, so our drugs get sent out to the lab and then it comes back. Car fentanyl, it's actually a horse tranquilizer and we've seen that popping up in some of the uh, results. Is it true that meth is back in Worcester? I don't think it ever left, but we've like seen it a little right. more. It's not its not our most popular drug, that's for sure. Um, if from uh, our experience, I would say, without seeing the actual stats, it goes fat and all, crack cocaine, um, cocaine, and then, you know, mess towards the bottom. But we do see it. Well, thank you, guys. I hope you guys are enjoying yeah, these. Uh, Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Tommy Farrakho. I've been on Worcester for, I started in 1994. I started my 30th year. I got on when I was 25. Married three children. Um, I started off on patrol in Maine South. Uh, then I moved to the, I was on the SWAT team in Maine South, and then I went to the motorcycle unit. Um, from there, I transferred into traffic because all the bikes could move the traffic. So that was like the backdoor way of getting into traffic because usually you're going to have you know, 20, 30 years on you look at the traffic door. Um, then they sent me to crash reconstruction school. Um, I have a degree in accounting from assumption and I'm a policeman. Um, so I, I, I'm good with numbers, basically. Um, so I have taken the, um, uh, the crash reconstruction school, all, all three levels, and I've been doing reconstruction since 2005. In 2010, I became a, a statewide uh, instructor along with Sergeant Foley, we teach other police departments. We put it through basic, we put it through advanced, and then we put it through reconstruction. It's, it's six weeks, it's 80 hours per course, and once they get that, there's still a bunch of courses like nighttime crash and you know utility pole strikes and, and truck crashes and figuring out all that stuff. So we have a pretty decent job. We have a, a nine, 10 man unit. Um, and we basically, uh, we don't really do citations, we're starting to do them again, but we, we basically, we, we take most of all pedestrian crashes, anything fatals, or someone who's in critical condition, they'll call our unit in. Um, the patrol officer will secure the scene and we'll take over, and we're gonna go over all this equipment with you on, uh, on um, how we do it and what we look for and how we get speeds from people, and we're gonna show you how we do traffic enforcement. So my name is Sergeant James Foley. I uh, supervise the traffic unit along with Lieutenant Walsh. He's the lieutenant out of our unit. Uh, I actually came from the school department. After I got out of uh, college, I went to work for the Worcester Public Schools. Uh, and then I literally left the school department on a Friday, started the police academy back in 2006 on a Monday. So I never broke uh, service with the city. Um, when I graduated from the academy, I went out on the road. I worked last half operations. So last half would be your overnight shift. Uh, for those of you that work that graveyard shift, uh, it's an absolute killer. Um, but I worked that up until 2011, 2012. Uh, I started taking some of the crash reconstruction classes. Um, took a really good interest into crash reconstruction only because of the fact a lot of the major crashes or the high speed crashes were happening at night uh, and I was involved in them. So took the classes, got certified, uh, ended up getting transferred into the unit in 2013. We made it a unit. Uh, and then in 2017, when I got promoted, I got bounced out. And one of the things, if you talk to most officials, um, unfortunately, when people get promoted, you usually get bounced out of a unit. You go back down again, and you work your way back up again. Uh, so I was lucky enough in 2019 to make my way back into the unit, uh, and I've been there ever since. I also have commercial motor vehicle. Uh, so I don't, do we have any CDL drivers in here? Anybody with CDL license? So I also did commercial motor vehicles for a while. So that is basically going around inspecting trucks, making sure the, that they're road, you know, road worthy and safe to be on the roads. Um, and so, like I said, back in 2017, I came back into the unit, uh, or 2019, sorry, I came back into the unit and I've been there ever since as a supervisor. So we'll go through this, we'll talk about, uh, we have basically at a traffic division, we have three different units. Um, we have traffic, crash reconstruction, and commercial motor vehicle. So in terms of the traffic, we have a day shift that operates from seven to three in the afternoon. Uh, we have four officers, one sergeant, one lieutenant. Our traffic evening shift, they run from 1500 hours, which of course is three o'clock until 11 o'clock at night. They have four officers that uh, shift as well, and they have one sergeant. 
that lieutenant supervises the whole entire thing. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the reconstruction guys, we have five reconstruction officers um, that work seven to three, Monday through Friday. And then the commercial motor vehicle, they work also seven to three. And they, two of those three officers are actually certified as crash reconstructionists. So they kind of do both. They do the DOT world and they also do the reconstruction part of it as well. So our traffic division, what they're responsible for is gonna be funeral escorts. So you probably see sometimes when we have funerals going around the city, especially if they're gonna be large. Uh, large funerals are very, very hard to move around the city. And unfortunately, a lot of people cut into funeral processions. So in order to prevent that from happening, um, we usually try to assign multiple units to help escort large funerals through the city. Uh, it makes a big difference trying to get people around, especially when you're moving Sometimes we'll have a funeral that could be 80 to 100 cars. Uh, so we do uh, help out with that. Dignitary escorts, um, you know, a number of years ago, we had um, Barack Obama in the city, the president. Um, that was a big, pretty big undertaking. Um, you're moving, you know, when you're moving somebody like that, you have to make sure that uh, you have enough uh, staff on board uh, along with some traffic guys to make sure they develop the route and work with the uh, Secret Service. Parking complaints. Uh, for those of you that live in the city, and especially if you live with us, a bunch of three families, I'm sure you're well aware of some of the parking problems that we have in the city. Um, you know, especially if you have something where you might have a multifamily and you have residential parking, and you could run into an issue where somebody would not, you know, maybe they don't have a residential parking permit. That could be some type of an issue where you might want to call and have somebody come out and tag it or tow the motor vehicle. We've also had some issues <coughs> down on some of the streets down on Main South where people are parking on both sides, they're parking in the wrong direction. Um, you know, if you travel lanes on the right-hand side, the vehicle, believe it or not, should all be facing the same way as the tra direction of travel. You're not supposed to park your motor vehicle in the opposite direction on that side of the on the uh, that side of the roadway. So we handle that. Speeding complaints. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm sure you guys are out there. You're driving around. You know, speeding has increased, especially after COVID. Um, speeding has really gone up, and a lot of times what happened was just the enforcement. I think went down. Uh, while COVID was going on, a lot of officers were afraid of interacting with people. Um, again, because you're handling a person's license, you're handling a person's you know registration in the car, and so that basically kind of a lot of the enforcement end of it dropped. Traffic um, was lighter too. It was a lot lighter, so but the problem is too. So you don't have yeah, and, and that's the other thing too. So when you have light traffic, right, <clears throat> you're not going to have those cars building up, and so people are able to go faster, and that's true, and that's part of the other thing that happened too. So enforcement was down. Now, of course, we're trying to correct that. We're going back to a little bit more of a steady enforcement, and of course, it's you know it takes time to change people's habits, you know, to get them to slow down. So we handle the speeding complaints that they come in for neighborhoods. One of the nice things that we've been able to do over the last couple of years as technology has advanced is we're able to now use speed monitors. And I'm sure if you drive around the city, you'll see these speed monitors set up. And the nice thing about them is they capture raw data for us in terms of how fast the vehicle's going and if the person actually reacts to the actual speed monitor, it will actually tell us whether or not they're reacting to it or not. So if it's making a difference out there, it tells us time. So if I know, for instance, that between the hours of, let's just say, 11 o'clock at night and 3 o'clock in the morning, that the majority of people driving by that sign are going 50 miles an hour, well, I can say to myself, all right, you know, that's a good time to stick officers out there to try to do some speed enforcement. Likewise, you know, in the afternoon, maybe peak travel time, um, you know, between the hours of 3 and 4 or 3 and 5 in the afternoon, people are speeding, same thing. We can say to our traffic unit, hey, guys, you know, between these two hours, we're seeing an increase over the threshold, which is usually like 30, 35. Now, for the city of Worcester, this the whole city is basically thickly settled, except for some of the state roads. If you're in a thickly settled neighborhood, that is 30 miles an hour. And actually, I think there's something right now before the city council, they're trying to actually drop that to 25 right. and Correct. drop it. Figuring that the more you drop it, people will hopefully come down a little bit from that speed of 40, 45, 50, and that's somewhat what we're seeing. Um, but the monitors give us that data and it gives it in real time. And in fact, some of them will actually capture photographs of the vehicles as they go by. And the idea of that, we don't use that, but we can also tell if it's an emergency vehicle. That's really what we're trying to see. So you could have an emergency ambulance, fire truck, police car going by to a scene. They're, you know, they're gonna be traveling in excess of the speed limit. <clears throat> and so that will just say, okay, we can take that data and shove that out because we know it's a police cruiser. We don't have to worry about it. We can't issue citations based off that speed monitor. So I just make sure everybody knows that. We don't issue, we don't issue anything off of speed monitors, all right? Um, traffic complaints around schools. 
unfortunately, one of the other byproducts I think of COVID, and not so much COVID, but even before that, is we tend to be a society now that we don't like to use our feet to walk to school. And we have situations where um, a lot of parents now are driving their kids to school even if they live a block or two away. And when you go back 20, 30 years, kids were told, go walk to school. Um, but we're seeing now that a lot less kids are walking to school and everybody's getting driven to school. The problem with that is increased traffic into these neighborhoods, and some of our schools are actually in residential neighborhoods. I mean, they're not on major roads where they can handle the higher volume traffic. So again, that's some of the c complaints that we get in the traffic division, so we send guys out to handle that as well. Um, general enforcement, um, you know, just stop sign violations, red lights, you know, we'll have complaints come in saying, hey, they're blowing this particular red light. Like the one most recently we came, that came into our office is uh, somebody up by Christ, the, the light that's up by Christ the King Church on Pleasant Street. A lot of times people come down the hill, you know, are trying to pull out, they have a, a green light, and all of a sudden somebody on Pleasant Street blows the light. So they're asking that we go up there and kind of monitor that. And I'll send a guy up there and we'll take a look at it and see how many people are actually blowing the light or not, or running the red light. Car seats is something that we picked up over the last couple of years. Uh, we do car seat checks now. So if anybody knows anybody that needs a car seat check and you want it checked, uh, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm a, a father of three <coughs> boys. Um, I wish I had the program prior to having my three because I can tell you right now, no question, I definitely installed that car seat wrong. Um, you would not be surprised, I mean, you would be surprised, I should say, uh, of how many people actually install car seats wrong. Um, you think it's as simple as maybe just taking the two latches and clipping them in and you're all set. It's not. There is a lot to it. Um, and so if you guys in the class or if you know somebody who needs to have a car seat checked or you, you know, maybe you have a relative given you know, birth or something like that, by all means send them to us um, and we can check that car seat out and make sure it's safe and it's put in the car properly. I'll tell you, we went out, we just wanted to show you what we had, and it's, the glare is pretty severe, but um, we're down on Lake Ave right now, we're just showing the, the, the rear radar, the in, this is a radar unit right here, there's a difference between radar and LIDAR. Radar is, is wide span, and it's, and it's pretty quick response, but you really have to monitor it because it can pick up a vehicle coming at you, a vehicle go, going away from you, so you have to watch the radar and watch the traffic. The LIDAR units, which is something I'm going to show you also, these handheld LIDAR units are target specific. There's a laser beam inside. At 1,000 feet, it's only three feet wide. Most of your motor vehicle stops are between, our uh, sites are between 400 and about 700 feet. So it puts about a two foot span on that, la on that laser beam. So there's no question. So if you are, if there's two cars in front of you and there's a car maybe 100 yards behind you and they're accelerating behind that car, we can get, we can avoid the two front ones and we can lock it on that third vehicle and get it for speed. And it will give you the distance you shot him at and the distance and the speed he was going at the time of shooting him. And we, I, when we approach a vehicle, we tend to show people that. The radar units, you'll never get to see. The end dash ones, I don't think any officer would walk you back to the car and let you look at the radar unit inside the vehicle. It's just unsafe for both the officer and the pedestrian and the, uh, the operator of the motor vehicle. Um, these radar units, uh, they're, they're pretty good. You can, they have a moving mode. Um, and what we, there's a low Doppler and a high Doppler. And all it is is how it picks up the radar and how it picks up motion. So the front cone, uh, which I think it's in another photo, the front cone as you're driving has a low Doppler that hits the roadway. And that number that it's generating on the, on the screen of that radar should be the speed you're going. So if you're doing 35 miles an hour in your cruiser, that radar unit will show 35. If it's not showing 35, your radar is moving and you have to readjust it, shut it off and reset it. If it doesn't calculate within one mile an hour of what you are doing, then something's wrong with the radar and you're not supposed to use it. In the meantime, it factors in how fast you're going and how fast that vehicle is approaching you. And it will lock in on your speed, all you have to hit the lock button. So if you are in those small towns and the cruise is going by and you're going this way, and all of a sudden he bangs a U-turn and comes back and gets you, and you say, how the hell did he get me? That's how he got you. He has moving radar, and it works the same way if someone comes up behind you. If you're on the, on the highway, like a mass pike, and you're accelerating, there's a few ways of getting you speed. One is clocked, where a trooper would stay behind you. He has to stay behind you for a half a mile and maintain your speed, but most times, like, like us, we see a trooper in the back, we sort of panic and move to the right and let him pass. Um, but if someone's not paying attention, someone's singing, someone's talking to their family, 
they're doing 80 in the highway because 80 is the new 55. I don't know if we all know this. If you're doing 60 miles an hour on the highway, you might as well be in the brake kind of way. Um, it's crazy. Uh, I'm, a, I'm guilty of it also. But I'm a, I do 80. <laughs> um, but in the, in your, in the, in the cruiser, he, all he has to do is stay behind you. He can also have a front radar. The low Doppler will pick up his speed, say he's doing 75, and all of a sudden you're doing 91. He can pull you over, and that, that will factor in for him. But again, it picks up a lot of motion. You have to watch it. If he sees you physically going faster than the beep, just say you're in the, the high speed lane, and, the, and he can see you physically going faster than the vehicles in the middle lane, it will pick up like the middle lane doing 60, it will jump back 91, 60, 91, 60. Mm -hmm. Just from visual observation, you, you will able, he'll able to pick up and, and point out you and be able to pull you over and with a good conscience cite you for that speed. The other thing too is a tone. There's, some of these devices have what they call is a tone on it, so the tone will actually change. So the officer will be in the car and the tone will change. It will go to a higher pitch. The faster you're going, the higher the pitch will be. So the officer will know what vehicle is going faster based on the tone of the pitch, and it will. It will jump back and forth. So, you know, when the argument's always made usually by the violator, the violator will make the argument, well, how does he know it was me? Because the radar, again, is not target specific, right? So the LIDAR is target specific, radar is not. So it's picking up everything that's in that field. Well, the reason why they know what, it, what vehicle it is is because of the tone or pitch, and you're also got to be watching it. The officer has to be watching it as it's coming up upon them. So the way we got you the way we this, so someone's clocking them. Right? Yep. There's a car coming. The well, the clocking, the clock is a little bit different. So if you're clocking somebody, you're you're actually behind them. You're, so you're watching your speedometer, okay. and you're watching, and you're just making sure you're maintaining that same distance in between. So if you're going, you know, because if you can, if you can maintain the same distance, whatever speed is on yours is going to be the same on theirs, right. as long as you're maintaining that correct distance. But then you were asking about if there's a vehicle traveling the other direction. Yeah. Using the radar. Yep. Yeah. It would actually say front and rear. So you have the ability of changing this to front and rear. So this is the system that's up here. There's a remote control down here, and you can actually switch between front and rear radar. Yeah. So if so, he's, he's tracking this vehicle, yep. this vehicle's going this way, and this one's coming this way. Yep. What keeps the radar from? It will jump, it could jump over to it, but it's gonna give you a negative number. A negative number. Yeah, Correct. so if someone's approaching you, it'll, it might say minus 65. Okay. Or minus 55, so you know it's that, it's that one. And this is, this is the front one. Now, now I told you, as we patrol and we have it on, on, on uh, motion, on move, movable radar, this number right here should calculate what I'm doing for speed. If it's not, I would reach over here and adjust it, aim it maybe more towards the road, and then tighten it, and then try it again. So we, the whole process is we go through a check in the beginning. You Sorry, Tommy, there's a better picture probably for you. Yeah. It's still blurred, but yeah, that was the speed I grabbed someone at. It has a range of how far it will reach out. You try to tighten up your range because a radar just keeps going wider and wider and wider. It'll get three, four hundred feet wide, and then if you start hitting power lines, it's going to squeal and squeak. And it, it's it, and if you if you don't have a clear pitch, then uh, um, it's no good, and you can't utilize it. So you you will tighten it up to like maybe instead of five dots to maybe three dots. And it narrows the, 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 the cone that it's, it searches for the vehicle on. Um, and then your speed will show up on one of those boxes. If you're in moving mode, um, you really can't sit and do stationary. It, it will work, but you're better off being in a stationary mode because it will be quicker for you. It's not trying to calculate your speed. And, and if you have no motion. And the way they work is radar picks some stuff coming at you. Um, if you see if you see an officer that you know some people will, will duck off the sidewalk, and you're saying there's no way he was able to get me, it's it's called the cosine effect. Basically, up until 10, 10 degrees and you're shooting your radar, your lidar, you're pretty much getting an accurate reading. The further you're away, every 10 degrees you're away, it's going to show a lower speed. It's always in the favor of the operator. So if the officer wants to stay off the road because we have bright yellow jackets on, we don't want to be seen, we want to try to get these people who are speeding to address some complaints, and we stay back 10, 15 feet. So I might grab the guy at 15 or 30. He could have been doing 53, but he's still going fast enough to pull over in the 30. And we sort of have a base, like 15 miles an hour over. You know, so if, some, if someone's in a 30, we'll give them a little leeway because people accelerate to pass people. People sometimes don't realize they're going down a hill. These new new cars, new technology. My wife has a BMW. Um, 
I'm doing 70 miles an hour, feels like I'm doing 25. You know, so it's, it's tough to get accustomed to. So we, anything over 45, we'll write people for, you know, 40, 42, we might just say, hey, slow down, stand on the road, slow them down a little bit, and they realize that they're going too fast. But to get back to the whole checks and balance of the radar, we check them before our shift. We have, we have accuracy things, we have distance things. And then how we shoot a citation, is how we make a, a ticket is we have to observe the vehicle. That vehicle has to bring attention to us. And this is like a thousand feet away. So picture yourself at the a, a football field. Picture yourself at one end zone and a car approaching you from the other end zone. You have no idea, all you can see is a car. Now you observe the car maybe passing other people a little bit quicker than the person. Now you, now you have to estimate their speed. So I'm, now I'm in a 30. Now we've been doing it for years where when we take new academies out and we have them try to guess estimations, they're all over the place. Where Jimmy and I can guess up to two miles an hour how fast that person's going. So now I say, okay, he's doing 48. I activate my hand now LIDAR, click on it, 47 and 30. I'll step into the road and pull him over. All that stuff has to be articulated in the R report, especially if it leads to some type of an arrest. The stop has to be good. Um, and again, you know, um, I'm, I'm a pretty easygoing guy, and, and they yell at me for it, but I'm, I'm a pretty, I'm a warning guy. I feel if, you know, if, if there's a girl in the car and there's babies crying, or it looks like you just get out of work, I'm there to slow you down. Hey, bud, you're going 50 miles an hour, slow down, I know you're tired, I know you worked all day. You know, the worst thing someone can do to me is argue with me about the speed as I'm showing them the radar detector, the light detector, and just have an attitude with us. We're, here, we're just here trying to slow you down for public safety, and then people, you know, right away, or, or they'll start videoing you. And I don't care if someone videos me, because I'm nothing but polite to people. You know, I try to treat people like I, would, I want someone to treat my family. Until you leave me to something else, meaning you, if you stop being a jerk to me, then guess what? You're getting a citation. There's nothing worse to get, and as you know, um, is to get a monetary citation. Now you got to, it's not so much paying the ticket, it's your insurance you have for five, six years. Um, so that's, that's one of the issues that, I mean, you try to think of the whole picture of things. You know, if, if, if someone slows down, and then when we go back and run the person, and the person has had a citation in 10 years, well, you know something, he screwed up today, give him a warning, the warning goes in there, so now Jimmy pulls over the guy, pulled over two weeks later, he says, well, Officer Frock will give you a warning two weeks ago, obviously you didn't learn. That's when you start citing people. And for the most part, that's how the traffic division. Our guys are usually pretty good. The traffic, you know, our traffic officers, what they end up running, doing is they run your KQ. And a KQ is your driver history, all right? So if they have the ability to run the driver history, they're gonna run it. And most of our guys are pretty good. Like Tommy said, if, if you have a, a, you know, a decent driver history, um, they're probably gonna let you off of maybe a verbal warning. But if you have a couple things on there, they might give you a written warning, or they actually might cite you. For instance, the cell phones is a huge issue. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But cell phones is a major problem, right? So if we have a grant, so the federal, and just this kind of goes along with the whole traffic um, section of our unit. Federal grant, the federal uh, government puts out a grant every single year for highway safety, all right? That federal grant comes to all the municipalities across the state. So during certain times of the year, holiday seasons, typically when people are gonna be out drinking, doing driving and stuff like that. And then during the summertime when increased speeds going on, a lot of people are out going vacationing and stuff like that. They release certain amount of money for people to go out and do enforcement. Uh, our our uh, department does uh, partake in that. Uh, and what we typically try to do is if they go out, we try to tell guys when they go out, listen to me, run the driver history, see what's going on. And one of them is the distracted driving. So if you go out, see somebody on the cell phone, they'll pull them over and say, hey, you're on your cell phone. Um, and then what they'll do is go back to the car, run the driver history. Well, if the driver history shows that you've already gotten pulled over and you have a cell phone warning, guess what? You didn't learn your lesson that time. Unfortunately, now it's gotta be monetary, right? Whereas if I pull you over and you don't have anything on your record, I might give you a verbal warning or I might just say, okay, now it's time for the written warning. Now, if you go back about, I don't know, eight years ago, maybe even five years ago, written warnings would not pop up on the driver history of the operator. Now they are. So just because you get a written warning, don't think that you're not gonna have to pay anything, there's no fines associated with it, but just so you're aware, it does go into your driver history so that when the next officer pulls you over, they're gonna see that you got a written, a, a, a written warning. Verbal warnings do not go in the system at all. So just so you guys are aware of that. Yes, sir. How far back does the driver history go? 
far. So you get your license? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you can so see. You get your license at 16, 17 years old. We have a driver's <clears throat> history on it. It's, it's, a, it's a national database. Cool. The one thing, though, and I'll and I, same thing, our offices are usually pretty good. So let's just say that we pull you over and you are you know, 65 or maybe 50 years old. That's going to be a pretty extensive driver history, right? But your last ticket was like 15, 20 years ago. I'm not going to really look at the rest of that stuff, only because of the fact that you haven't, been, you haven't committed a violation in a long period of time. I'm not going to sit there and jam somebody up from that. I, the education part of it is more important to us than the monetary end of it. Unless it's something where citizens are complaining over and over and over again, we've gone out there multiple times trying to warn people, and the people are still speeding through the area. Then we have to go monetary ticket right out of the gate. So we try to make sure that education is a huge part of uh, traffic stops. So. When the seatbelt law first came out, we went out there and we actually combed everybody down to one lane, looked in their car, you wearing a seatbelt, we gave a keychain. Make sure your kids a seatbelt. That it was more of a safety thing. We did that for like three months, and then we went out and did warnings for three months. And then after that six-month period, people who it's a secondary charge. So again, if someone's speeding, if I see someone without a seatbelt, besides a child, if I see someone without a seatbelt, then we cannot pull you over. If you run a red light, or if you're speeding, or if you do an unsafe lane change, you can be pulled over and you can be cited for your seatbelt. Your seatbelt does not go against your insurance. So. We, like if I have someone speeding and no seatbelt, I'll say to them, sir, I just cited you for your seatbelt, just pay the seatbelt citation, I gave you a warning on speeding, and it doesn't go on your record, it doesn't go on your uh, uh, insurance. So people are happy about stuff like that. Now you bump it up, the seatbelt law, everybody pretty much wears it. Um, the cell phone law came out right in the heat of COVID. So one, we weren't enforcing it because they told us that, you know, less interaction unless you have to. If it's an accident, you have to help. But, you know, just try to make people aware of it. People are on their phones all the time. And again, we would just pull up to them and say, hey, uh, cell phone log, sir, you gotta have it on a monitor. You gotta have it on a mount. So a lot of people think they can keep it on their lap, which is even worse. Now you're looking down at it. You're better off putting it in a center mount and you can still peek over. It's basically called one touch. And with the phones today, all you have to do is talk to it. Again, my phone still doesn't understand me. I try to text my wife, <laughs> and it sends a text to my mother. I mean, it, it, it doesn't pick up my uh, my New England accent too good yet. So, but but you could easily, hey, Siri, text Luke, blah blah blah, my son. You know, make sure you're home by ten if I'm driving, and now we'll go through. There's no reason to use your hands. You know, and if, if I, I, when my kids first got their licenses, I made them put their phones in the trunk. You have to stop, get out of the car if, you, if, you, if the call's that important. And it's not. It's usually something that, hey, I'm on my way. Uh, we had a young kid uh, coming out of work. <coughs> he killed a young, a young girl on Grafton Street. Nicest kid in the world you would meet. He looked down at his phone. His mother was texting him, hey, mom, I'm going to my friend's house after work. The time he looked up, he already hit the girl. Two lives are ruined. The girl is deceased. This kid will never drive again. But they also have Bluetooth. Use that goddamn Bluetooth. The Bluetooth, and I'll, I'm going to be honest with you, though. Some of the newer cars, though, is it, it's pretty scary how much technology. And because they're going away from, like, some of these cars now are going, like, like, Teslas and stuff like that. They're going away from any of the dial knobs for, like, air conditioning and all that kind of stuff. Now it's all touch. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just as bad because you're, you have yeah. to look yeah, yeah. to hit it. So some of that stuff, the voice automation stuff is probably the best way to go, right? So that would be the best way to, to, to have it work. So you can just touch something and then voice activate and say, hey, can you turn my heat down or turn my heat up? That technology is all coming. It's always, you know, again, I, I understand it's a lot of the times it's up in the higher model vehicles, but it's working its way down. I, look, I mean, look at the rear view camera, right? Mm -hmm. Most of your newer vehicles now, it's required that you have to have it no matter what model you get, whether you're in the base model or in your high end model, you have to have a rear camera on or some type of alert system on the car. So, yes. yes. So is it true that, let me say for example, you pull over to the side of the road to like maybe text and stuff, must you turn off your, your engine before you do that? Believe it or not, you're not even supposed to be on the roadway. You're supposed to be completely off the roadway and not in a travel lane with the vehicle in an off position. It cannot be in an operating position. That is correct. Okay. The way, if, you look at, if you look at the law, if you look at the law, like, because you, you know where the biggest problem is? Red lights. Right, people pull up to red lights and they start texting, thinking that they're all set. And we'll go up, we'll pull up to them. And I'll be like, I pulled you over because the red, because you're on your cell phone. 
And they're like, well, I'm, at, I'm stopped. I'm not moving anywhere. I go, here's the problem. How many times have you pulled up behind somebody and they're all of a sudden they're sitting there? You toot the horn. What's the first thing they do? Start moving. Well, what if the light has now turned red, a pedestrian's crossing in front of them, or the traffic's already going? That person now just got spooked into going forward and now they're getting hit. So that's the danger with it. And that's why they don't want it. They want absolutely, it's only one touch operation. And if you're going to text or do anything like that, you got to be completely off the road. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's what I meant. So, like, like being on the shoulder. Let me say, for example, on the highway, you're on the shoulder. Yep. And you, and you're texting. You would want to be completely off of the brake. You want to be like on the shoulder on the breakdown lane. Yeah. yeah. And I would, again, I'm, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be totally honest. I don't like being on the highway at all, and even in the breakdown lane. Yeah. We've seen people, troopers. Um, we've seen people innocently just sitting on the side of the road and next thing you know somebody comes back the problem is it's just the speeds are too great right so highway i would highly recommend unless you really have like a flat tire that you can't get off the highway or you can't even like pull on the shoulder like if you take a look at some of the stops that i've made over the years when i've assisted mass state police up on, on 290 here i've actually gone and assisted the trooper and i'm standing on the opposite side of the guardrail while they're interacting with a person on the side of the road i'm over the guardrail just because i just know from my from our work from doing reconstruction, I just know how dangerous the highway is in terms of cars. If you just picture someone on that highway doing 75 miles an hour and they look down at their phone yeah. for a text. They start drifting. And they drift over mm -hmm. all the time. It's not a fender bender. It's people dead and, and cars are totaled. Let me just kind of push on a little bit. I do want to show this image here. And you can see where this car is here. Can anybody tell me who's driving that car? No. Can anybody tell me race of the person driving the car? No. Anything. That's typically where we're shooting our light up. That's 750 feet from today where I went. We have no clue at who we're pulling over at that particular point. When, and, then, and our decision is being made at this point to pull this vehicle over. Um, and so it shows you how far away we're shooting, especially with the radar. Oh, sorry, not the radar, but the LIDAR units. Because we can shoot all the way down. And like I said, we can't tell who we're pulling over. There's Officer Frocco out there today. Yeah, I did hair and makeup about an hour before. <laughs> <laughs> this is that car right there. The last previous slide was, was 250 feet away. That tree's 250. So what we do is, as we sit here, that that lidar unit also just does distances. So if I was to activate it right now, it would tell me that wall is say 42 feet away. I shoot this tree, this tree, this tree, this tree. So it gives me a range of where these cars are. So I know that's 250. I know that one was about 475, and one down there was 950. It picked it up. So I know as, as cars were approaching me, and again, just to get into the speed of things, if someone's doing 30 miles an hour, they're basically doing 45 feet per second. I know there's two, 300 feet between these trees, and I'll count one, two, and if he's already at that other tree, I know how fast he's going. We're not even using my hand, I'll lie down. It's just from doing it all the time and teaching it mathematically to other academies. Simple math, all of our crashes can be solved with simple math. And to get back to the crashes, the severity of crashes, most people can survive. The cars are built today with road cages. The problem being at 40 miles an hour or 50 miles an hour, I'd say 50, you're doing 73, 74 feet per second. You might stop with your seatbelt, but everything in your body is still doing that speed. Yep. Everything loose in your car, so if, you have, if you're a bowler, and you've been on your back thing, you're dead. If you have an unbuckled child, and you that kid's gonna get lodged 75 feet per second into the back of your head or into your windshield. We can't tell you how many times we've seen crashes where kids have been in the car and there's been some type of like bag, purse, something aside of the child that could actually hit that child in the head. So and if even you're heavy and loose and dangerous, I would put it right in your trunk. Even and again, you don't. You throw it right in the back. Of your even trunk. the aftermarket stuff that we all attach to our car seats and stuff like that to entertain our children—that's not good either. Uh, believe it or not, a lot of that stuff can come off in crashes and cause cause injury. So, just to show you, this slide right here—that's the target that you see through the lens when they're looking through this. This is the binocular version. This is at 1,037 feet. Again, can't see who's driving the motor vehicle, or you can't see anybody for that matter. But they fixated the target there, and then you can see, I don't know if you can see it or not, but 71 miles an hour for that one. So, so that's on that. Um, reconstruction, uh, just getting into this. Uh, the reason why we have to have specialized training on that is because the, just the complexity of the crashes. Um, a root guy going out to a crash is not gonna have enough time to pull video from area businesses, um, have the training to download with uh, any of these cars with the equipment that we have. 
um, you know, do interviews and you know, talk to the drivers, talk to witnesses. Um, that all takes a lot of time. And so, especially when you have a severe injury, that's one of the reasons why our unit exists uh, and our guys go off and get trained. <coughs> So as Tommy was talking before, the basic investigator has over 240 hours worth of classroom. That's you know all three levels. Most of our guys in our unit have almost over 500 hours of classroom instruction. Uh, they've gone up and down. I've, I've traveled as far as Peachtree City, Georgia for training. Uh, so it, it could get, I mean, there's a lot of different classes, pedestrian, bicycle. Um, we've done uh, you know throwing motorcycles off the back of moving trucks. We've done all kinds of stuff in some of these classes just to figure out how, you know, it, it, you know different elements of the bike, you know, if you have a metal bike versus a, something that's made out of fiberglass, the different um, makeup of some of these vehicles will cause things to react differently with the roadway surface. And your drag factor, which I don't know if we'll have time to get into it, but that drag factor, the coefficient of friction, how that vehicle or how the person or how anything slides on the roadway, that factors into our equation and how to determine somebody's speed. A quick um, thing on that is that concrete's very high because it's it's porous and it stops. That's like a point nine. Where brand new asphalt is point eight five, wet leaves are point four, ice and snow point one, point two. So that gets so, all that gets back to our formula. This I'll just show you the drags that we use. So we pull this. This is thirty five pounds. We pull it ten times in the direction of the skids, and it gives us a force. We divide it by the weight, and it gives us our drag factor. It's sort of a pain in the ass, but we. We gotta get, we gotta go. We let those rookie pull it. No <laughs> so typically, here how it works is that nine one one call, call you know nine one one call comes in. Somebody calls in, hey, we got a motor vehicle crash. The operations officer they'll respond to the scene. You know, hey Sarge, this is, and they'll report back to their official. Hey Sarge, this is what I have. You know, I have a crash here. Person's going up priority two, possibly a priority one. So I don't know. If, does anybody here listen to our radio channel? When it goes, so if you're listening to it, you know. So if you hear somebody say, "Hey, it looks like it's going to be a priority two, maybe a priority one," pretty serious injuries, the official is going to come back and say, "All right, you know what? Probably call up the crash reconstruction team, have them come in and, and take a look at it." So um, if we get called in, um, we're there to document roadway surface. You know, the, the uh, sorry, the roadway evidence. We get a hold of witnesses. One of the big things that happens is. Um, depending on how long it takes the operation guys to get there, we'd like to have our witnesses separated. Does anybody know why we want to have witnesses separated? Once people start talking and say that they saw this, next thing you know, that person starts, it goes into their brain, they're like, oh, you know what, maybe I saw that too. So you want to try to separate people out before you start giving witness, or taking witness statements. Most they people don't actually see the crash. As you stop to talk to them, they go, oh, well, I, I heard it and I turned, and then all they see is the aftermath of it. Right. They don't know who caused it, who ran a red light. When? Someone who's waiting at a red light for a crosswalk, those are your best witnesses. Because yeah. they're, they're actually looking towards the, where it actually occurred. So the other thing, too, is we secure motor vehicles. We do scene photography. Our guys take photography unless it's going to be a fatal. If it's going to be a fatal crash, then we have our CSU uh, guys come in and they take our photographs. Um, but if it's not a fatal, uh, our, our guys will take it. Um, usually I sign a lead investigator. And then we use an LTI system. So the system that we currently use is basically this handheld LiDAR. And it sits on top of this axis point. And so once you spin this around, this gives you basically it's called a true angle. And it will give you the degrees of which way it's, it's pointing. And then you shoot points. And so what it does is it inputs all those data points uh, into a mapping system. And then from there, we just basically connect the dots. It's almost uh, like the police driver. version of surveying. Uh -huh. When people come to survey your land, we do the same. And we'll give, we'll take maybe two, three, four hundred points. We have a guy who comes back and he'll, he'll make a drawing, and it's all to scale. So if I go back to him and I just had a crash, I said, how far was the pedestrian in the roadway? He went from the edge of the curb, stretched out the measuring thing, where point of impact was. He goes, Tom, he's in the road at 17 feet. So now when I type my report, um, know how I told you vehicles doing like 40 miles an hour, it's, it's you know 65, 75 feet per second. We do the same thing for pedestrians. Well, how long did it take him on the video to get from point A to point B before he was hit? Even my last crash, he was in the road for three and a half seconds. Nighttime crash reaction time is two and a half. So if anything, she should have started breaking prior to him, mm -hmm. and maybe his injuries wouldn't have been as severe. 
she didn't break until after she struck him. So one, she was going too fast, or she wasn't paying attention. And three, she didn't have a license. But that's behind the story. So some of the other things too, we canvas the area for video. Believe it or not, our guys, we have a couple guys that are trained on video uh, reconstruction, meaning that they could take a video and what we do is we go out and mark point A and point B, and based on the frames per second, for those of you guys that understand video systems and how they work, they record in frames per second. What you see is something that's a fluid motion, but behind the scenes, if you look the way it's recorded, it's recorded in all these different frames. And so based on the how many frames per second the vehicle travels in the distance, we can come up with a formula that tells us exactly how, ha how fast that vehicle is going. And so sometimes we'll have just the video to go off of. Sometimes we'll have the video in a download from the car. And when we line the two of them up, they usually come within a mile or two of each other. It's pretty impressive, especially with the newer system, the newer cameras, because they're, they're high def. And you have a lot more frames per second. Uh, and there's just the quality is a lot better. So um, <clears throat> we talked about cell phones. If the person has a cell phone, um, if we do have a cell phone and we think the cell phone is in play, uh, we usually get a search warrant for that. Even the download on the, the motor vehicle itself, if you, and I'm sure most of you in here, the cars you're driving, I can tell you right now, your vehicle's gonna be downloadable. So you get into a car crash, we're gonna hook it up to a CDR program, it's, called, it's made by Bosch. Um, we're able to download the information off it. It's gonna tell us a couple different things. It's gonna tell us speed, whether you're braking, whether you're accelerating, whether you're seat belted, not seat belted, if you're a large person, a small person, whether the seat was forward, or whether the seat was backward. So in case you have something where husband and wife or maybe you know girlfriend, girlfriend type deal where they end up switching, one person's large, one person's small, and the seat's adjusted that way, and they try to you know do the old switcheroo because the other person's impaired, we can tell by the download who is sitting where if there is a difference in size of the person that's sitting there. So it's pretty impressive, some of the technology. If you made an evasive maneuver prior. Uh, yeah, steering uh, input. It does your ignition cycles. You don't realize how many times you start your car, but this vehicle's up there with 10, 12,000 ignition cycles. Um, so it tells us just about everything. Yeah, so when we go to download the vehicle, whatever your ignition cycle will tell us at the time of download, at the time of crash, what the ignition cycle was. So we're able to match all that up. So say somebody gets in a crash and says, no, 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 there's no way that that data is part of this crash. I had a crash prior. No, 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 no. We can tell by the ignition cycles at what time this actually, this, you know, where this fits into the sequence of events for the car itself. So it's pretty impressive. Um, the same thing I told you, we need a warrant actually for the airbag control module. Um, this is some of the technological advancements that we've, you know, we've had over the years. The LTI system, this mapping system. Now we're, we're currently trying to push for a FARO system and it basically, it's a laser scanner. So instead of us sitting there for you know, a couple hours getting points and we're getting individual points, we just basically can come out, we can set up a unit and it actually scans everything. And, it, and so instead of us doing like maybe one shot every couple seconds, we're gonna be able to do like 50 to 60 to almost a million points um, in the same amount of you know, time it takes us to shoot a couple points. So we're hoping to get that system and it just makes it a lot easier and then it's a lot more detailed, you know, um, rendition of, of what happened in the crash. The Burla system, this is new. Um, this is a pretty neat system. This actually allows us, so how many people in here have rented a car before somewhere outside? They've gone on a vacation, they rented a car. How many of you have plugged in your phone? When you plugged in your phone, you had a dump of your phone. Now, maybe not all the phone, but a lot of your stuff actually came on the phone and went to the hard drive that's on the car itself. And a lot of people don't realize that. So you've got to make sure when you return your car rental, go into the settings and make sure that you eject your phone out or you know, delete your phone out of that system. Otherwise, you do have information that will be contained inside that vehicle. So that Burla system basically goes after that hard drive in the infotainment system, and it pulls all that information out. So it's a pretty neat system. That's how they, they, if they get someone's phone or if they get their car, is involved in like a, a slew of like bank robberies. Mm -hmm. It puts that car in every one of those locations. Your GPS location, GPS all that locations. stuff. Wow. That's um, they were able to grab if you have bank robber in New Hampshire recently. If you have OnStar, oh. all that stuff, all that stuff is basically mapping and tracking you. So again, and, and it's not like we can just go in and take the information without having probable cause, right? We have to have a search warrant to get all this information. But just understand that that information is there and it is available to us. Um, to download. That Celebrate system, that just downloads the phones. Um, video surveillance, again, same thing. We try to, area businesses are usually pretty good with giving us video surveillance, but I'm gonna be honest with you, we've been getting a lot of stuff on Ring cameras. Oh. People's doorbell cameras, Ring cameras, Nest cameras, Google cameras, all that stuff 
it all provides a, a pretty good uh, indication as to what happened in the crash. This is a rendering of a drawing that we did uh, of a recent crash that we just had. Um, and you can see this is uh, West Mountain Street here. And this is the off ramp that goes over to Brook Street. Uh, we had a crash there uh, just the other day involving a dump truck and a pickup truck. Uh, the price chopper, or market 32, is over here. But that just shows you. So we had somebody go along with the points, uh, or with a, um, a prism, which is this piece right here. So they go along with this prism, they walk around, and then with this unit, and we have a little tablet, we just basically shoot it, and then we can plot it, and then the guy will come back and he'll actually draw it and diagram it. Um, that other system I was talking about that we're hoping to get, um, we'll actually be able to take a drone, fly the drone above the crash scene, and take a photograph top down, um, and then you'll be able to fly the scene. Basically, you're, you're using the computer animation, but we'll be able to actually go through the scene itself uh, and see exactly what happened. And we'll take the information also with the download. So and then we'll talk about airbag control modules in a second, but airbag control modules, um, the CDR download that gives us all the information about speed, this software will actually let us input that as well and put everything into real time motion so you can see exactly what happened at what speed it happened. Do you have a question? Do you work on the drones you already, drone you already have? Or you have it, it will work with the drones we already have. <clears throat> so it's just a matter of them going up, flying above, taking a foot. And the nice thing about an, a top-down approach is you get to see positions of vehicles, especially if you involve a crash where, let's just say a kid or some adult comes out of in between cars. It kind of gives you a better, like I can take a photograph this way, but it's not going to really give you where the kid came from on the sidewalk. Whereas that top-down view kind of gives you a better look at what happens. Now, we could pull maps off of Google, Google Earth. Mm -hmm but they're not up to date, right? So you can have cars parked in certain positions, but the day of the crash, they might not be there anymore. Maybe something different. So that drone allows us a nice top-down view of something that's actually there, you know, and it's live. Um, it makes it a big, it's a huge difference for us because it allows us to put things into place to say, okay, is the driver at fault or is the pedestrian at fault? And where do they come from? Should they have been seen? Should they not have been seen? How many accident reconstructions do you do in a year? Usually? So we do. So this year we did 42. Uh, out of the 42, we had five fatalities this year. Uh, on average, we on a normal year we're usually between 12 and 13 fatalities. And I don't think a lot of people understand that there's 12 and 13 people usually killed in, in the city uh, from from crashes. So it is a, you know it's a high number. Um, we've had some years where it's been a lot of pedestrians. Uh, this year, the five that we've had, there's been I think three or four medicals. So some type of medical episode happened, and it's usually, you know. They didn't, um, they didn't, they didn't pass because of the crash. Right? Yeah, it was something medical that happened prior to. Contact or an overdose and then crash. So um, commercial motor vehicle unit, uh, I, like I said before, we have three guys that handle that. Um, their, their biggest thing is making sure that the trucks that are out in the roadway, they're safe. They test brakes. Uh, they go through the whole entire truck, making sure the safety, the lights are there, the horn's working, uh, windshield wipers working. They also make uh, sure that the person is not driving over their hours. They have, a, you know, I'm sure you guys probably heard driver logs and stuff like that. Yep. Um, we do have issues with overweight vehicles in the city of Worcester. Some of the trucking companies are running overweight. Um, that poses an issue too because of braking ability, right? The, the heavier the vehicle, the harder it is to brake. Um, this here is a photograph from. A tree company, they decided to put out three of the four outriggers, um, and the other one was not put out fully. So I don't have to tell you, when they decided to lift the heavy tree up over the house, that's what happened. Uh, we got there probably mid-morning, and as you can see, we're still we were still there pretty late into the night. We had to actually use another crane, the crane to lift the crane. So you have to see this yellow crane in the background lifting this crane, and of course then we have a uh, Ricky's toe, they had come in to try to get the back of it stabilized to get that flipped over so we wouldn't do any more damage to the house. I was going to try to show you guys a download from your airbag control module, but just to give you an idea what your airbag control module looks before we uh, wrap this up. These modules sit inside your car, and so this is basically the brains that operate your airbags and your seatbelts. And what a lot of people don't realize is that, believe it or not, in your seatbelt system, you have pyrotechnics in there. So there's actually a, a charge that goes off and basically straps you in closer to your seat and takes basically the slack out of your seat belt. So these control your airbags and it also controls um, the pretensioners that fire on your seat belts. And one of the things I like to tell people, especially when we're doing some type of demonstration, is the importance of wearing seat belts. Um, just because you have an airbag in your car doesn't mean that the airbag is going to save you. Um, those things come out with a serious amount of force. 
It's the combination of the seatbelt itself and the airbag that's going to save and protect your life. So, yep. The other big thing I learned is that the seatbelt keeps you in control in an emergency. 100%. Yep, yep absolutely. Um, we had actually, we had an accident in the city, this is going back a number of years ago, where a bus driver was pulling out of Sullivan Middle School. And she had basically pulled into, she pulled into Sullivan Middle, and again, most of your school buses in the city, and actually pretty much RTA buses, all the, all the buses, all the major buses in the city of Worcester all have cameras on them. But she had pulled into Sullivan Middle, you know, she had done her check, and what they're supposed to do is once they drop students off, they're supposed to walk the bus, make sure all the kids are off the bus, and then they go back up to their seat. Well, this uh, particular driver uh, got back up to her seat, and she started fiddling while driving, trying to buckle herself in. So she approaches the gate to make a left-hand turn out of uh, the Sullivan Middle uh, lot. As she turns, she's still fiddling with her seatbelt. She's on an air ride seat. And I don't know if anybody has ever been on an air ride seat. It kind of goes like this. So as she's doing that, and she's trying to shift her buckle over, she starts to turn, right? And now she's going out of the seat. Well, if you're going out of something, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna let yourself fall or are you gonna grab onto something? Yeah, you're gonna grab onto the steering wheel. What's that gonna do? So she grabs onto it like this, and all of a sudden, now the bus goes immediately left into a house, into a bunch of parked cars, and she got, literally, she comes down, she's in the seat, she starts coming out of it, and she gets basically flipped upside down and sent down into the, the what they call the stairwell of the bus. All because she didn't want it, but if she had had her seatbelt on, she would have been in the seat the whole entire time. And that would have never happened. It was pretty funny once. <laughs> 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 Sorry. So, I know we kind of rushed through it a little bit. If you have any questions, we'll be more than happy to take questions from you. But that's, in, in a nutshell, that is our traffic, our reconstruction, and our commercial motor vehicle unit. Um, like I said, I know we have, <clears throat> you know, we do have some other stuff up here if you're interested in taking a look at it. This, believe it or not, is from a fatal accident. Um, and I'll just tell you quickly about this. Uh, this is actually a pretty good, um, pretty good model of what we do. So this crash happened on Main Street a number of years ago, uh, right by the McDonald's on Main Street. A uh, person driving a minivan ended up hitting a pedestrian. And all that was left on scene was just these small little pieces down below. And so uh, we picked them up. Uh, and if you can see on here, and I'll, I can pass this around too, just be careful with it because it took a long time to glue this together. Uh, and, then, and unfortunately, the officer that I did this with is actually, he, he passed away, so it is kind of important to our unit. But if you look down there, you can actually see a model number, correct? Yeah. So as you, and you see the Chrysler symbol. So mm -hmm. we knew right out of the gate what we were looking at, right? We knew we were looking at a Chrysler model. The only problem is, is that Chrysler makes Dodge Caravans, and there's a bunch of different, right? The Plymouth Voyager, Dodge Caravan, uh, and there was the town and country, Chrysler town and country. So we knew we had a bunch of vehicles we were gonna be looking at. However, it allowed us to narrow it down and we ended up getting a tip that this vehicle was being pair, repaired at a, one of the local body shops. Wow. And so we got, a, we got a search warrant for it and we ended up going dumpster diving and we ended up finding the headlight. So we came back to the station, glued the whole entire thing together. But if it wasn't for these pieces down below, we would have never solved the crash. So it's just because these small little pieces. So if you ever come upon the scene of any type of crash or anything like that, don't touch anything. Leave the evidence there, especially if we're going to come in, because that evidence is going to be important to us, as you guys see right here. Wow. All right. Again, we'll stand by if you guys want to ask any questions. Other than that, you guys are free to leave. Is that correct? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.